We are so very excited about our next guest, Killian Murphy, the star of the blockbuster film Oppenheimer, which has earned him his first Oscar nomination. The movie has already raked in more than $900 million globally, and it's now the highest grossing biopic ever. Wow. Isn't that incredible, yeah, Gail? Yeah. yeah. Murphy stars as J. Robert Oppenheimer, known as the father of the atomic bomb. Here's a clip. What do you take it to mean? Neutrons smash into nucleus, releasing neutrons to smash into other nuclei. Criticality, point of no return, massive explosive force. But this time, the chain reaction doesn't stop. It would ignite the atmosphere. When we detonate an atomic device, we might start a chain reaction that destroys the world. And we're so happy to say Killian Murphy joins us now. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Also morning. so happy that it didn't destroy the world. Yes, <laughs> indeed. The chain indeed. reaction did come to an end at some point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so far, anyway. Gail said something in the green room that you've won every major acting award for playing a leading role. Leading up to this, yeah. yeah. leading up to this moment for playing a role that Matt Damon, the brilliant Matt Damon, as General Leslie Groves uh, describes as describing Oppenheimer, a dilettante, a womanizer, a suspected communist, unstable, Theatrical, egotistical, neurotic, but also Killian, as you know, a genius who becomes death, destroyer of worlds. Yeah. How did you take on a role that was so monumental? Yes, it was huge. I, I realized it was a, a big, big part when Chris Nolan called me um, back in September 21, I think it was, he called me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I was aware of Oppenheimer. I was aware that he was the father of the atomic bomb. and. I was aware of the Trinity test in 45, but everything that happened afterwards was kind of new to me and that, that whole aspect of his life and the hearing where he lost his security clearance and all of that and how he kind of became, you know, vilified in American society, even though he had been this, he the most famous scientist in the world. And that was the kind of Promethean aspect of the story, I suppose. Yeah, so I knew it was a huge one and I knew I had an awful lot of work to do as quickly as I could. But you yeah. took it, you took the role without having read the script. Yeah. But you yes. said it was the most terrifying role you've ever taken. Yeah, I mean, terrifying in a good way, if that makes sense. It you does. Know, I love work that is very, very challenging and scares the life out of you because you think, how am I going to do this? It's such a huge thing to take on. That's the stuff that really gets me going rather than something that I think, yeah, I know how to do that. Uh -huh. You know, I love when it's this just the biggest challenge you could imagine. Really. But you and Chris had worked together six times. This you, this is your sixth project together, so there must have been some comfort level to working with him. You yeah. guys must at this point have your own secret language on how well you all work together, true? Well, I think you develop a shorthand with people that you work with an awful lot, and you develop a trust, which is the most important thing you can have. You know, and there's a lot of the time, we don't really talk about it too much. It just sort of yeah. happens on set because I feel really safe being directed by him and really secure and you can really push yourself and he pushes me. But how are you taking all the reaction to the movie and to you in particular, Killian? Because there are some people, they get on stage, they go, yes, I deserve this, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, look at me, mom. Yes, look at there me, it's, it was only a matter of time. <laughs> but yeah. for you, there is such a humility and such a grace about you, almost like you're uncomfortable with all the attention, but at the same time, you know you're very good at what you do. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I, 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 it's just, a, it's a brilliant time for the film. None yes. of us ever anticipated that this. the film would have, yeah, this response, just sort of critically and, you know, commercially, and that the thing that, it, that, that I get most of a kick out of is people who stop me on the street and say, man, I've seen your movie five, six, seven times. <laughs> And you, you really realize that this is a story and a film that's really profoundly connected with people. And, and you you know, that's very humbling. And, it, it, and, uh, and um, we're all still still kind of in shock. In shock of a it. A little bit, yeah. But look at your, your life's path, because I, I was reading about you that even as a kid, when, you, when you're on stage, it's your happy place. Yeah. You really, you, you act on instinct and you're not afraid when you're acting. I was Tell always- Tell about your process, yeah. You well, I always... mean, I, I think that some kids are like that, you know, I always, Loved getting up in front of the adults when we were kids and at the family gatherings and playing music or all of that stuff. And it felt really kind of natural to me. And I wouldn't say I'm the most outgoing, kind of gregarious person, but that... I wouldn't say that either about <laughs> you, Mr. Murphy, <laughs> yes. But, but being on stage, I, I always loved. And yeah, first always of all, it was music for me, and then yeah. it was theater, and then eventually film. So. 
There's a, I, we're all focusing on the acting. They're all very high-minded, I'm less so. Uh, there's a scene where you climb a ladder <laughs> oh, yeah. in the movie, and the wind is going crazy, and obviously no one's got a control over the wind. It's not a wind machine. Yeah. Was that scary? I mean, we're gonna show a clip of it here. Um, what, yeah. You know, the stunt director says it was harrowing for him, so. Uh -huh. I mean, it, was, it wasn't so bad going up, coming down was the part I wasn't crazy about, you know. Um, but we needed the wind to, actually come up that day because that was historically what happened and it just all blew up that 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 at that precise moment where we needed it so you know I was all tied up and everything but yeah. it's still uh yeah it, it, it but that's what Chris is Chris does when he makes films he puts the actor in the real environment as much as he possibly mm. can always let me ask you a question for uh, the Peaky Blinders fans out oh, there, of yes. which I am one. Yeah. I know uh, that you've said you don't want to give us, the fans, false hope. But if there was a compelling story to continue Tommy Shelby's story in a film, yeah. would you be open to doing that? I think you kind of answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> like, because it, for you, it's about the story. It's always about the story. It's always about the script. We have an amazing um, scriptwriter, Stephen Knight, who, who, who's written all 36 hours of Peaky Blinders. and. Uh, if, there's, if he feels like there's more story for, for Tommy, then I'll be there, you know? Love has, that. Has doing, playing this role, focusing on the atomic, uh, the creation of the atomic weapon, has it altered your awareness of the fact that while we're sitting here right now, mm. we're told there are atomic weapons pointing at us and we're pointing them at somebody else? Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think, you know, it seems to have ebbed and flowed since 45, you know, uh, our consciousness or awareness of it. Um, and I think it's coming back now again. But it's an awful lot for people to carry around in your head, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, really. That's sort of yeah. like that there is that sword of Damocles kind of yeah. there 24 7. So people choose not to. We have an awful lot to get, be getting on with in our lives and be trying to get, just try to get through the, the day. Yeah. But what I like about this movie is that it's, it's a piece of entertainment. Um, but it, it is provocative. Yes, it does ask very questions. Much so. Incredibly comparable. And I, 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 I like that in film. You know? I can't wait for Oscar night. To Me see too. You Me too. We're Just cheering saying. you on. Putting it out there. Killian Murphy. Putting it out there. Thank you very, very much. I'm sure many of you are curious. Is my beloved Daily Show going to change? Well, it might, subtly. And I know change can be painful, but from change comes growth. A moment for us is gone. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is John Stewart's first night as a host for The Daily Show on Comedy man. Central, as he says. <laughs> handsome young man, 25 years ago. So he went on to host the award-winning program, you know this, for 16 years, becoming one of the most influential voices on television. Wow. Stewart stepped away in 2015, right at the top of his game. And starting tonight, he is back at the anchor desk at The Daily Show on Mondays. We won't talk about why just Mondays through the 2024 election cycle. He will also serve as executive producer. Comedy Central, like CBS, we have to tell you, is part of Paramount Global, and we're very happy to say John Stewart is in the oh, studio. Well, Paramount Stewart. Global, baby! Yes. yes! Come on, who's yes. got the tote bag? Yes, <laughs> Paramount <laughs> Global tote bag. It's all well, in the green room, sir. Wait till you see the swag you're green. getting before you I leave. thought it was called Viacom, but now it's, I guess it's Paramount. Oh, no, it's Paramount it's Global. It's called Paramount. It's Paramount I, I want to talk about your news. There's billionaires moving us around on a Stratego board. <laughs> yep, and now yeah, you're Paramount Global now. And you're now located at top of the Paramount Mountain, sir. Yes, you right. are. We're going to talk about that in just a sec. I want to know, you must have watched the Super Bowl. Your thoughts before we get into your new adventure. Uh, for, first of all, Patrick Mahomes, I, I, I have not seen someone with that preternatural ability to I just... I know, man. You yeah. just knew when San Francisco didn't score a touchdown in overtime that he was going to do yeah. what needed to be done. It's... Yeah. It's really remarkable to see a guy at that. I mean, people forget, he, I think he's only 28 years old. 28, yes. yes. Which is... Three seconds, John. Three seconds left. It, it, three seconds left. Oh, for the field goal. Yeah. Driving uh, it down. Get him yeah, into overtime. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, three seconds left. I thought three seconds left, and I was like... <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> this see you later. Interview. <laughs> <laughs> three seconds left, I was like, all right. Good luck to you. <laughs> this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for asking about the Super Bowl. Okay, but John... John, I'm wondering if you've missed us as much as we missed you. Uh, who, who somebody writes about you about John Stewart. Yes. John Stewart was a voice of reason in my generation. It's great to see him returning. There has been no better host of The Daily Show since well, he Well, that's, that's very kind. I've got some other comments that I've read. <laughs> slightly less uh, uh, but what effusive, was, what, but okay. what, what went into your thought process about I want to come back, and I only want to come back one night a week uh, for now? Well, I very much wanted uh, to have some kind of place to uh, unload thoughts uh, as we get into this election season. And I thought I was gonna do it over at, uh, they call it Apple TV uh, 
Plus. Plus. Yeah. It's uh, it's a television uh, enclave. Yes. Very small. Yeah. It's like living in Malibu. We've Nobody, heard of it. Yes. Yes. Right. right. Uh, but they decided that they didn't. They, they felt that they didn't want me to say things that. Uh, okay. Might okay. So. Get me in trouble. So you so might you have say some things, things you want to say. Are you back because you're worried about what's happening in the country? Not at all. No. no I'm <laughs> I'm totally fine. Everything's going beautifully. No, I just thought who better to comment. Uh, uh, on this election than someone who truly understands uh, two aging men past their prime. I mean, that's, I mean, look at me, baby. Not so. Not I mean, so. this is where it's at. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, by a third. Are, yeah, so yeah. Fair to say you are hoping to have an influence on politics. Uh, I don't know about hoping to have an influence, but I'm hoping to have uh, a, a catharsis and a way to comment on things and a way to I express them that hopefully people will, uh, will enjoy. But, you know, as far as influence, I mean, and, and you guys know this from doing this, I mean, just about everything that I wanted to happen over the 16 years uh, that I was at The Daily Show did not happen. Mm. You know, if, if you were hoping for influence, and I think I've learned that post-Daily Show, like sort of kind of being lucky enough to watch you know, activists, like as they move to the PACT Act and the toxic exposure bill, like being able to observe that, that's having influence. You know, wa watching people mm. do that. I liken television to like, if you can occasionally provide air support to those on the ground who are actually doing mm -hmm. the work. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't view it as, I really want to have an influence on this uh, issue, election, things like that. It's what we do. Yeah. yeah. But you, you you have had some influence when it comes to 9-11 victims, uh, to, to veterans, but the landscape has changed since you left. Oh, sure. And and so in a world now where people, young people get their news from social media, from TikTok, mm -hmm. uh, how do you think that that is going to change the way you do what you do every night, or at least on Mondays? Uh, well, generally, it's I will be doing it with choreographed dance moves. <laughs> so and only in 15 yeah. seconds. <laughs> With a lot of graphics, pointing to a lot, a lot of, graphics. of graphics. pointing in there. I mean, they always talk about how this audience doesn't, every, information is information. And if it's good content, people will find their way to it. So true. I think the worst thing you can ever do is to pander to this idea that somehow young people uh, absorb knowledge and information in an entirely different, I can remember, you remember the, the, in news when it got that way, they were gonna do, what show is it? 2020 Downtown. They were going to yes. do Downtown because <laughs> yes. the kids are downtown. Yeah. And it was the that. same show as it was, but like John Quinones had to wear a black leather jacket. Yeah. <laughs> so the kids would be like, I get this guy. Yeah. yeah. But, but John, you do have a unique ability to call out both sides when you see that they may be fluid with the truth, is how often. And, and a say. unique allergy to the idea of both sides. I mean, yeah. You want to call out the truth. I, I think it's, it's a question of. You know, what, what are the axes that we're working off of? I think generally you like to work off of the difference between corruption and integrity as opposed to right and left or Democrat and Republican. And if you focus on integrity and, and try and expose what you think is absurd or corrupt, it'll find its way to wherever it finds. But those are the parameters that you're trying to use. And satire is still the way you can do that? It's, I, for me, I think it's probably the only way I can do it because I don't really know how to do it. And, and why, sometimes, why just Mondays? Yeah. Because rainy days and Mondays always get me down. That's, so a, that's, that's a, a song. And what's your influence and, on the other days? Yes. Uh, it's, yes. It's, an, it's an excellent question, and I, I, I appreciate that. He's not going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought it was, I thought that was, let me say about that question. Are you taking question. a knee on this question? It was hard driving, and it was probing. Mm. Well done. Mm. <laughs> no, I, I just felt like just doing Mondays. You know, when you come back and, and you know, I was very much enjoying my, my life. Well, and when they came back, you know. But, but and, well, to Tony's the, question the about your influence yeah. the rest of the days. Oh, 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 I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, well, the choice, uh, well yeah. here's the thing about everyone over there. First of all, the team there, there's a lot of the same people, especially in the uh, upper levels, uh, that were there nine years ago. They're unbelievable. Jen Flance, who's the executive producer. Love Jen. She's amazing. Runs yeah. a ridiculous ship. Like, just knows what she's doing in a way that is uh, really impressive to watch. And all the, uh, the writing staff and the producers, it's a building filled with incredibly talented Yeah, but now they're adding yep. you to the yep. mix, John, yep. so that's gonna mean something. It's, it is. It's, it's gotta, gotta mean, mean something. It, 
Hey, this is my signal to we have to go. It's my you know, I'm just Oh, is that really? Yeah, is that, I'm, I'm going to get I'm going to wipe the sweat off my forehead. They're yelling at me now. It's No, no, we're, no. Don't, we're don't, in don't trouble. yell at them. These guys have been up all night. We're in trouble. God's sake. So have you. Be kind. So we appreciate you. you being on. And no, we'll be I drove tonight. here from Utah. <laughs> oh, wow. We, you should have gotten on the plane with us, Jack. Oh, Thank I could have saved myself so much trouble. Uh, Superstar approaching, superstar approaching. <laughs> please, please, please. You must have known I was coming because you could hear the horns, I'm sorry. Da, 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 da. Right? <laughs> please, please let me please you. My intentions are good. Stone Cold Freak with a K. Okay. The new music. Oh, you I, like need please a, you? I need a room within a room. Please, please, please let me please you. My intentions are good. Yeah. My intentions are good. That's a good one, right? It's a real good one. Okay, that's what we got going on. Usher, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> our Super Bowl halftime. So here we are. 48 hours away from the Super Bowl. I would not be sleeping. I would not be eating. So take us to that morning of what are you thinking? What are you eating? What are you doing? The morning of? Yes. You know what? I've, I really pride myself on being in the moment. Yeah. You know, you can spend an entire life career, right? Trying to anticipate what's going to happen tomorrow. Thinking about what happened yesterday. I'm really just as present as I possibly can be. I have a, you know, daily regimen. But I think that that day would be a little bit different. Uh-huh. Um, in solitude. You know, I guess I'll be in solitude. I'll be calm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think um, although I'll have breakfast with my kids, it'll be kind of like a, a very uh, calm day before the storm, Is the it? storm, you know, because um, I sit lot. here. I'm not even going to be on the stage and I'm nervous. Yeah, I'm nervous. But, and it's not a, it's not a nervous of can he do it because I know you can do it. Mm-hmm. But it's just you just you just wanted to knock it out of the park, which I also know you can do. Yeah. Are you feeling any of that or no? Um, no. You, know, you know what? Uh, sure, I know nah. this is true because I said to somebody, I'll bet he's really not even nervous about this because this is something he's wanted his whole life. Yeah. He knows that he's ready and he knows that he can do it. Well, greater than that, I know that I have an incredible team that has really put together an amazing display of 30 years. It was the hardest part really was like curating the music. Yeah. So working with... Um, my creative director, uh, Akamon Jones, and the Avela Brothers, and also to Little John, who was my musical director. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a it was a, a lot to try and squeeze in thirty years in twelve minutes. You know, how are you going to squeeze thirty years in twelve minutes? It's a question everybody's been asking since Jay Z first said Usher is the guy. Yeah. How are you going to do that? Um, he left it to me to you know make certain that I didn't miss the culture. That's the one thing that he that he said. You know, we're we doing this for the culture. And, you know, while you have completely spanned the entire world with all of the genres of music mm-hmm. and for 30 years, those songs that mean something to us that we know your hit records. I want you to I want you to play the ones that we that we love, that we know you for. Give them the moments that they you know look forward to seeing because you, you know, either dance them or you've either you know, culturally had something in this time. Like, go for the culture. I'm like, all right, I got you. That's interesting. That's an interesting direction because I think for those of us who are all playing the parlor game of what's going to be in, what's going to be out, yeah, that gives us some indication about what you're thinking about. Yeah. True. The greatest um, preparation for it was my biggest residency. Uh-huh. It gave me the greatest reference. Uh, and, and by the way, what he was asking for is what I do already. Uh-huh. Uh, but uh, in, in Vegas, every night, having those moments because I wasn't just playing a new hit record. I was playing my classics. Yeah. I was playing those songs and doing things with the songs that either you hadn't seen in years or maybe have just seen for the first time. But, um, you know, the dance would be there. Uh, there's an elegance, an, an idea between past, present, and future, knowing that as we're moving forward, yeah, these ideas of how I'm choosing to use my own records yeah. don't just take you back there. Yeah. They bring you to a new idea. But I'm skating, I'm, you know, bringing I, I know culture from gonna, Atlanta you're to You're going to skate in the Super Bowl, Vegas, right? yeah. Well, you're gonna, okay, I'm going to take that as a I'm yes. skating. Don't tell me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I do <laughs> Let's, uh, will your shirt remain on at all times, Mr. Raymond? Is this Speak a per- it to the microphone. Is this a personal request? Yes, it is, sir. Would you prefer that I take my shirt off? Okay? At some point, yes, sir. Okay, cool, gotcha. I think I can, <laughs> I know a guy who knows a guy. You know what I mean? And I'm not objectifying <laughs> you. I just have very good taste. You know, part of the fun of the uh, Vegas residency was there was always a serenade moment. Yeah. How will you or can you serenade in a big stadium? You have to take the moment. Do you want to practice on me a serenade or just throwing it out there? I I'm here to help you. I need a place... A space to get off. Something that's on my mind. What would you do? How you feeling right now? Are you feeling? You got it. Keep going. 
<laughs> no, but I was wondering how please you... Please let me, please let me, please you. Yeah. That's on the new record. That's it. Uh, oh, I yeah, love that. I love it. that. And, and this is the thing, because what people, some people don't realize, so you were on the Super Bowl stage. For many Super Bowl people, this yeah. is performers rather, for many Super Bowl performers, this is their first time on that stage. This is not your first time. You were there 2011 with the Black Eyed Bees. Yeah. So when you were there, was there a part of you to yourself saying, I want to do this one day? Yeah, of course. Was it? Yeah, I mean, it's a bucket list for every artist, right? Uh, and it can mean one of two things. Man, I've done something incredible enough to be given this honor to perform before hundreds of millions of people. Or this is, you know, the culminating, you know, energy that says, you see me, you celebrate me, and I have done something amazing in this lifetime. For me, Vegas was like a, a restart, you know, after all of the years of being an artist with, you know, um, creativity working along with record companies. This was a new idea. As an independent artist, I'll be the first independent artist to ever play the Super Bowl stage. Really? You know what the hope first? that yes. You know what hope that gives artists? I'm an independent artist now, not, you know, I yeah, I'm playing catalog records, yes, but yes. for the most part, yo, the work that I did here in Las Vegas, it led to this. So that means you too can believe in yourself. You know, I, if you got records or you either have an idea, believe in it, push, uh -huh. you'll get where you want to go. Mm -hmm. You know, some people want to win a Grammy, you might not. Some people want to win an Oscar, you might not. But you got love and you got passion in your heart, you'll eventually get to a goal. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I've man, won tons of Grammys, never walked on one stage at the Grammy and said thank you to the world. I've never literally walked on stage and said thank you guys for recognizing what I do. But I can say I actually played the Super Bowl. Yeah. I haven't won an Oscar yet. Maybe yeah. one day I will. Yeah. But, Tony, but, but what do you mean you've never walked on the stage and said thank I, you? I, I, the the categories that I've been in have never been televised. Seriously? Yes. I, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So you've never, wow, let's take that in for just a second. Yeah. All the Grammys you've won, you've never been on a Grammy stage where you could publicly say to everyone, thank you. That's great. That's mind boggling to me, Usher. I did not realize that. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, but don't you think you sort of made it? Now it's like Super Bowl, <laughs> drop the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. You did something good. You did something right. It'll be a celebration. It'll be a celebration of those records that have meant something to my fans, those records that have meant something to my life. As you know, it's a bit of a testimony every time I make an album. I'm talking about where I've gone, what I've experienced, and, you know, things that I think emotionally tie us all together. But as you sit here today, because you're still so young, you're not even 50, you look at the legacy of your work. What does it mean to you when you sit back and look at all that you've accomplished? What does it mean to you as you sit here today about to take the Super Bowl stage? Believe in you, mm -hmm. no matter what, you know, you may feel, because life is full of peaks and valleys, mm -hmm. you know, and whether you perceive a negative moment as something that was negative or made you better. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It is a process. But belief in yourself is the one thing that matters among all of the things that you could pick up as mantras in your life. And um, that's it. I think about my career in that way, that it's not about one highlight moment. It's not about one low moment. It's about the fact that I celebrated it. I shared it. Mm -hmm. I was collaborative with other people in sharing a message that I feel ties us together, yeah. the music, you know? You know, I, th I think that you have... I'm wondering whose opinion matters to you most because you sit here, the father of four. I'm so happy you have a little girl. Gosh, is she beautiful. The ruin video we get to see and hear, it's nice. Um, Which is true. She ruined me for everybody. Did she? Yeah. Oh, I know. There's something about a little girl, isn't it? It makes you soft like, and like you've never been. Yeah. It's like we're, we're having a tea party, yes. <laughs> Yes, I saw you. <laughs> you even know how to hold a, a teacup. You have to, yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah, we have high tea. I know, but I, I love that for you. <laughs> but I, I know that you're, I know what your children mean to you. And yes. I know that you're older, you have the bigs and the littles. And yeah. I know the bigs are very vocal about your performance. Yeah. Who's in your head while you're taking this all in? Uh, Naveed. Naveed. Na you know what? My little. How old is he now? He's Naveed. 15. Uh huh. And, um, you know, he's got his vision and version. Of what songs I should play, yes. what dances I should do, and um, you know, just you know, it's it's a it's a very interesting thing to become cool enough, cool enough okay. to be cool enough to even 
be considered by your kids because at some point you just kind of lose cool. Yeah. Well, I'm cool to the littles right now. They're like, you get to skate. Oh my God, we get to see to see today. By the way, my kids are out like a light by seven o'clock. Uh -huh. Seven o'clock on a dot, they sleep. That's uh -huh. the new seven o'clock on a dot. But it is nice that your kids think you're cool. They, yeah, it's cool that my little ones, and my bigs do too. You uh -huh. know, they might not admit it. But, yeah, but they do. But they are, um, they're supportive, but they do have a heavy opinion about what I should be doing. You should play this song. You should have this person come. You should have this guest. Why not do this dance? You should make your dances easy enough for the world to do it. Da -da 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 -da. Like, man. <laughs> <laughs> does their opinion matter? Absolutely. It does? It does. It does. Are you planning surprises? I know I, there's only so much you'll say to us. I, I know that. Yeah. I have some great surprises. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be an amazing Super Bowl. It's going to be uh, a celebration. I've spent the majority of my performances in this lifetime attempting to please and offer. This will be the one time that I get a chance to enjoy it. It's really about me enjoying it this time. And you being in the moment. Yes. I mean, you know, you said that for you, when it was first announced, you said, I want to make this the best Super Bowl performance ever. And you didn't say it with any arrogance or any cockiness. I, I could tell that that's just what it meant to you. Yeah. As a crescendo of what I've been able to do here in Las Vegas, you know, and the belief that came with me coming here, uh -huh. to have this be one of the most grand moments would be amazing. Uh, viewership would be great, yeah. but the effort and the time, if you've seen my show, you know, yes. I, I, I don't, I spare no expense in no, making I've certain that you. my audience really, really enjoys themselves. I've done that. I've curated it a level up, uh, from my residency, obviously playing Cured a up. stadium, but I get a chance to enjoy it this time. You know, there are some people that say Kansas City Chiefs, 49ers great. I'm watching for Usher, Usher, Usher. You know who wins the Super Bowl? Usher. Usher. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say when you know Usher, that? Usher, baby. Yeah, what do you say when you know that there are many? What ring is this, this by is, the way? This, this is my championship ring right oh, here. Wow. So it's coming, coming home. home from the album. Wow. Yeah, but check this out, right? So that's the Super Bowl. I know. 58. And then you open it up. <gasps> oh, wow. Yeah. It's gorgeous. So I, I got no skin in the game. I'm, it's, it's San Francisco and the Kansas City Chiefs. Jackie Aish, uh, my, my jeweler, she made this, but it's got my wow. stage on there. Did you cry when you saw that? I did. I got it this I'm morning. I'm serious. I just got you it. You got it this morning? Yeah. So we're the first ones to right. see it. I feel like crying too. Yeah. But what does it mean when you know that some people are watching because they really want to see what you're going to do? There are many people like that. You know that. It's a celebration of our culture, a celebration of R&B, a celebration of a career. Uh, a nine-year-old who just believed, yeah. you know, and I feel like that nine-year-old once again. I felt like that nine-year-old once again, just believing in this idea that we could get back to normal. Out of the pandemic, we came here yeah. and there was a promise that we would get back to normal the way we did before, but it was amazing and offered me something that I hadn't felt in a long time for my fans. But Usher, could you have dreamed this big? Seriously, at nine years old, yeah. at, at nine years old. The, the yeah. thing, the thing you can, you can, yeah, you can. And for the nine year old out there who is speaking in this manner, that someday he or she can travel the world, he or she'll have fans, he or she'll sing on stages, he or she will be greeted and recognized by incredible interviewers and, and, and curators and, and an artists. You can do whatever you, you want to do, yeah. just say you can. I do believe and that, believe it. You mm -hmm. just said it, don't mm -hmm. hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hope, hope is not a plan. Hope is not a plan. Mm -hmm, I do. Belief is something that... It, the thing about real. your music is people say it's great music to break up to. It's great music to make love to. <laughs> it's got beautiful love songs. Yeah. So I'm sitting here talking to Usher, and I want to know what Usher, for Usher, what's your favorite Usher breakup song? What's your favorite Usher makeup song, sexy song? Um, what's your favorite Usher I love you song? So let's do breakup song first. Wow. Breakup song? Um... Big Sean, mm. but it's a little explicit. I don't with you. Yeah, yeah. You look, like, but no, I, I want you to pick up. Yeah, I like that. Actually. I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about for you. For okay. Usher's favorite breakup song. My favorite breakup song that you do Ooh, is my favorite breakup song was Let It Burn. Let It Burn. Oh, yeah. I was going to say Confessions because I. Well, love confessions. that wasn't a breakup song. Well, they gonna be breaking up. Well, when the chick, your side chick, got one on the when way. When the side chick got one on the way, I mean, at least you confessing and no. she understands. She, she has to make a decision, no. right? Well, we know what her decision gonna be. Just yeah. like I like in the new album where you said, uh, "I'm I'm in love with the girl on the side." We yeah. both know that it's wrong, but it feels so right. I mean, even the lyrics to that. Okay, 
Okay. Yes, I, I'm a professional and I love you. <laughs> okay, that's your favorite breakup song, your favorite sexy song. Sexy favorite, time song. Favorite sexy like, time. Like, we're going to have a great time tonight. I mean, great. Oh. It's going to be good. The, I am the party. I am the party. Yeah. Yeah. That's new coming out. I am the party yeah. is the ultimate record. Okay, and if you had to yeah. pick from your old catalog, what would it be? Um, but I am the party is good. But if you had to pick from the old one. Two dozen roses. Um, man. Do it to me. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Trading places, do it to me. Okay, that's those good. Are, those are good ones. And yeah. your favorite Usher, I really love you song. You are my everything to me. You are my everything. I just love you so much. Your favorite I, when you love someone. It's a song called I Love You. That's on my new album. But, you know, there's seductive songs and playful songs like Twerk It Out. I yes. love you. That, that's where it's about us not going out and just having yeah. a good time and yeah. doing the things that we want to do. Yeah. Um, matrimony. Okay. If that's there's a good. question of my love, you got it. That's good. It don't, it don't belong to anyone but you. That's good. If there's a question of my heart, you got it. That's good. Baby, don't worry because I got plans. You know, yeah. this seems to be a good time to be usher because Super Bowl... New music going on tour. You know what? I'm an artist that you can get married to. I'm an artist that you write. You can break up. To, yeah, you, there's a song for every experience that exactly. I've had. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. You're pretty good. That was pretty crafty. But see, but, but this seems to be a good time for you. Really. Yeah. On to, wait, let's start with Super Bowl, mm -hmm. on tour, mm -hmm. and new music. Well, new music so as, of, as of the night. Yes. Um, Super Bowl. Today, yeah. After 100 sold out shows here in Las Vegas, yes. just Thank launching a tour, Past, Present, Future. Looking forward to that one. Um, it's selling very, very well. Get your tickets early. So many people hit me like, yo, I need, I'm like, hey, get your tickets right now. Don't wait till the last minute. But at this stage in your life, did you say, I want to kick it up? Because you're doing a lot, is the point I'm making. The point was to bring what energy we managed to uh, conjure here in Las Vegas and now bring it to the rest of the world. Okay. A lot of new music, but this experience, I wanted to cover all bases. That's why I called it past, present, future. And there's only a select few of artists who've had that long enough a career mm -hmm. to be able to celebrate and also to still remain relevant in this time. Yes, yeah. relevant. Mission yeah. accomplished, Mr. Raymond. Boom, there you go. Bravo. Can we just walk over to the window? Yeah, okay. okay. This is so yeah. cool. I think this Here. is spectacular. <laughs> you got to put it on a big finger. Put it on your middle finger. Here, could you put it on me? Yes. Can somebody take my picture? You don't have to get... Oh, get you, go ahead. Get down on your knees. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The answer is yes. 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 That's so well, cool, It's right? gorgeous, though. Yeah. Wow. I would cry, Everybody too. has their championship rings. I, this was something that we wanted to do. That was No, when you really did special. that to the camera, I just actually thought it was jewelry. Then I thought, is that the Super Bowl logo? Yeah. God. Your jeweler, your jeweler did this? Yes. Wow, she's wonderful. She is. When you push the U and it comes open. It's so cool, right? It's beyond cool. Oh, man. Yeah. She's good, too. Yeah. That's the stage. I, I so know what it is. We just want to walk over to the window. Let's go. Damn, I'm so psyched for you. I can't even tell you. But here we stand. Yes. Look at this. Yes. I know. Let's just Vision take Stadium. a moment. Yes. I think that we have to savor the moments. Maybe this 45th headed to 50, 46th year Yeah. Um, has helped me understand savoring more. Because mm -hmm. I'm always working. I'm always focused. I'm always mm -hmm. planning on the next thing. But this is a, a time where it's not about meeting the requirements or the this is just about enjoying the return coming home and being like celebra celebrating that the, the homecoming of all of the work that i've done in my life mm -hmm. that right there is my belief that yes. right there is that nine-year-old who saw an audience before it was there that is that nine-year-old that had belief that one day the time that he was putting into building a career could become the one that i have now oh. So, and if you had to say three words on how you want the audience to feel about your show or what you feel about the show, three words, what would that be to talk about your show? Three words, past, Just, present, future. That's right. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. I mean, your mom, your people must be over the moon. Yeah. And your children. Yeah. Everybody's gonna, it's going to be a celebration. It really is. But I'm going to try my hardest not to 
cry, break down and cry on the stage. Just one of those moments, really. But if you do, that's okay, too. Yeah. That's a, I'm sort of thinking with the emotion that you have, how could you not? Yeah. Because the audience is so excited and so many, so many people want this for you, you know? Yeah. They want it for you. So many people have prayed and been patient and supportive and, you know, and also to contribute it. Like, I... I, I I didn't do this by myself. No, I know. You know, I years know. and years of work, determination and dedication is, is why I have this moment. But you know? what, what we know, Usher, is that hard work doesn't scare you. And with this ring, I thee wed. <laughs> Does it go here? No, here. There you go. Wow. It's spectacular. Thank you. Um, I know you have a busy day. What are you going to be doing for the next couple Preparation. of days? Relaxing? No, are no, you no. still rehearsing? Still? Yeah, we're still rehearsing. still rehearsing. We have one more rehearsal. Uh, inside we do the everything building. with wardrobe and everything would you do you want to say initials of the surprise guests <laughs> <laughs> no gail no no i'm gonna <laughs> okay. keep you in suspense i okay. think so from the moment it was announced honestly i just thought he's so at peace and so calm even though you said at first it was hard to believe when jay made the call but once you when you take it in you were so zane and i were talking about that the other night at clive's party that he's so ready i believe in the idea of manifestation and affirmations mm -hmm. right the moment that i heard i'll tell you this now because i have it uh -huh. the moment i heard that they were entertaining the super bowl coming to vegas i was like i'm not leaving i'm what staying i'm giving him no choice <laughs> really? I'm giving Jay no choice. Like, you know what? I'm going to stay here until you see I am the only option <laughs> Did you? for Las Vegas. Yes. Really? There's nobody so, else who could play. I, hello. So you I'm here. Did you extend your residency? Yeah. Did you? Yes. When you heard the Super Bowl was coming? Yes. It's like, but by the way, I knew. I was like, you know what? If I just stay here, it's going to happen. You, you really, truly believe that? I believed it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Look at God and look at you. Won't he do it? Yet won't it every time. Yeah, every, every time. time. Yeah. Could you manifest a nice guy for Gail? <laughs> <laughs> you got any friends, any cousins? You're any, looking you know? amazing these days. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Thanks. I definitely, but you were you were in such a good place in your life, both personally and professionally, because you've been through all sorts of stuff. But you're here in 2024. I'm happier wow. than I could ever be having an amazing partner yeah, she's that has lovely. supported me through all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, my family being happy. Mm -hmm. uh, and being connected, you know, and I just, I just, I'm, I'm at a place where I'm at peace. I'm happy. We are so lucky. You are too. Why? Because our next guest is the extremely funny actress and comedian. Jenny Slate is in the house today. She's starring in her second stand-up special out this week. It's called Jenny Slate, Seasoned Professional. I love that title. Slate hilariously talks about giving birth to her favorite daughter, Ida, why she was, quote, brave for love, and her relationship with her therapist. Here's a look. I love my therapist, and I know you're not allowed to say that, but um, I love her. I love her. I love her. Um, I love her. And I actually find that, at this point, to be the hardest part of therapy. <laughs> that, like, when the session is over, you're not allowed to be like, okay, bye-bye, I love you. Okay, bye-bye. I love you, Jenny Slate. is back in the house. Jenny, it's so good to see you. Well, Thanks for having me here. back. I know you hit on so many um, notes that are very relatable. I love what you were taught when you took us through the birth of your daughter Ida, and you and you 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 were very um, sharing in that moment. Yeah. But you also say, can you imagine if men had to deliver babies uh -huh. through their penises? Yeah. The story that we'd be telling, like, hey, did you hear the story about Sam? But it's hilarious the way you do it. Thank you. I'm glad. It's it's definitely meant to be. <laughs> yes, yes. Mission accomplished. Yeah, but it's also really good to to um to be able to even within comedy just like gently put down some of your observations yes. that might not be um like that you thought of first, you know, like going into a comedy set like am I really going to do this my entire birth story? But it turned out that I really enjoyed it. And it's very funny. Yeah. And you also, the title, I like seasoned professional. You said, a, you went to a hip, hypnotist. Yeah. You, did, you really did. Yeah. And the hypnotist said you were a seasoned professional. Yeah. What, what does that mean to you? What did that mean to her telling you that? I think that what it meant, and by the way, that's like the only thing that really got implanted in my psyche, everything else, because I went for stage fright. I was gonna say, why did you go? Yeah. I went for stage fright. I, unfortunately, I won, I guess, or whatever. Like I pushed through the hypnosis and yeah. continued to have stage fright. But um, 
he implanted this one thing that's like, you know how to do this, you know how to do your job. And before I go on stage, I find myself saying, I'm a seasoned professional. Mm. Even though I still have self-doubt and all of that, this is, this is my version of what it means for me to be a full-fledged professional. And I'm, I'm happy that it's this complex. I'm like, I'm pretty proud of it yeah. at this point. I, it's hard to imagine that you having stage fright. Yes, you're I so commanding on stage and you work through so many different registers and voices and, and uh, it's really nimble. I mean, it's, it's very funny also. I love the story about uh, wanting to confess love to your now husband when you're just starting to date and knowing it's gonna be too much. <laughs> totally. <laughs> that chill people don't really exist. That was me, by the way, in my relationship. The roles were reversed. Um, I, but, so, how does that story develop into a whole bit? I mean, did you just start telling it on stage and open mics or you just knew it was funny in the moment? Like, what's your process like? I think first it starts um, in conversation with my friends and I'm like, what do I really want them to know about my life and how I'm doing and how can I be honest about it? But you know, when you're like out to dinner with your friends, you wanna be usually entertaining, I think, you know, <laughs> you have a good personality. And then it's like, I enjoyed that. This is interesting to me. There's an edge to it because it's personal. So that's kind of like the fuel for me. And then I'll start to improvise on stage with it. And eventually it becomes more formed, but not so formed that I'm sick of talking about it. Yeah. But your whole thing was being brave for love. Yeah. I like, didn't yeah. you like that? Yeah, yeah. I like how you frame that being brave for love. What did you mean being brave for love? I think it takes a lot of courage to participate in any sort of love, yeah. self-love, romantic love, true love of your ambition or your, your career or whatever. Um, <clears throat> you have to look at what scares you. You can't just like push your fears aside and plow through. I think to really love means to completely know and understand. We were talking during the break about your daughter, Ida, and how much you love being a mom. <laughs> yeah. How would you like her to look back at this period of the body of work that you've done, Marcel Lachelle, all of that? What, what do you think that she would say? I hope she looks back on it uh, however she she wants to, that's up to her, but I hope that she sees me as a person who was confident enough to continue to express myself even though I do not um, really identify with a sense of perfection. Mm. I more hope that she sees me as someone who tried my best to be truly alive. But what I, are you aware of Vlad is a new dad? Yeah. And are you aware of Vlad is a new dad? Yes. Yeah, so the two of you can Yeah, we were talking, that's why I was asking about, you know, a lot of things that are coming my way. Yeah, both of us are technically asleep right now. That's the whole thing. <laughs> but you've got a great thing coming up, a Colleen Hoover book. You're gonna be starring with Blake Lively. Yes, Go, that's Jenny. true. Yeah, I'm really excited. Which one of her books? She's very- um, It ends with us. It ends, it ends with, with us. It ends with us, yeah. 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 Huge I, hit. I, I, and I'm, I'm just excited to bring it to life for all the fans. It's a it's a big thing, so yeah. yeah. It is. It I'm is. excited for you, Jenny Slate. Yeah. Cheering you, you on always. And Ida's mom. Well. Congratulations. Come back to talk about the book. I will, Life thank form. you. Don't act like you don't well, know. Let's talk about the, <laughs> yeah, the stand-up. Five-time NBA All-Star forward for the Boston Celtics, Jason Tatum is here, and he's gonna join us to talk about a very big announcement first on CBS Mornings. SoFi, the new official banking partner of the NBA, is unveiling a partnership with Tatum's foundation. It will make a multi-year commitment of more than $1 million to help low-income, single-parent families create generational wealth, which is much needed. Jason Tatum joins us now. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Um, this is a personal issue and something that means a little bit more to you than the average guy just partnering with someone. Um, what do you hope to achieve with this generational wealth fund from SoFi? What I hope to achieve, right, like you said, it's organic to myself. And being able to partner with SoFi on something that we are both passionate about, right, growing up in St. Louis in a single parent household, understanding how valuable this would have been um, to me and my mother. So being able to achieve generational wealth for myself and then change the community and change uh, the place that I came from with that. For those that don't know, um, how did you grow up? D did your mom have everything she needed? Did she have all the resources? Did you have a silver spoon even though she was a single parent or did you have moments of struggle? So my mom, my best friend, I'm a, the biggest mama's boy. Still mm. your Till this day. I like that. That's beautiful. Uh, I think so too. Yeah, I grew up in a single parent household. My mom was 19 when she had me living mm. check to check. So, you know, financial literacy or learning about a savings account um, you know, we never had those conversations because there was no saving. We were just trying to make ends meet mm. from week to week. So understanding that she sacrificed everything that she had to put me in a position to achieve my dream and create generational wealth for myself and for her and for my son later down the road. And now just wanting to extend that branch 
um, to the community and change lives where I grew up. That's I know awesome. you were such a cute little boy. We saw pictures of you and your mom, <laughs> and now your father, to Deuce, who's six years old, uh, Jason Tate Jr. Deuce, we call you call him. So he's growing up very differently than you grew up. Mm -hmm. So what are the lessons that you were passing on to him? What do you want him to know mm, that you didn't question. know? Yeah. Right, and I think as a parent, you want your child to grow up in a better situation yes. than yeah. you do. You want to provide a better life. Um, and you while, can do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. While he's six, we, it might be too early to have those conversations. Uh, we will have those conversations eventually, how to uh, respect money and you know how dad worked for these things. Right um, to provide him and give him a leg up when he gets older, um, to set him up for whatever he wants to achieve financially yeah. and then you know his career. Have you thought about how you do that? Because I've always heard the the best way to teach a child respect for money is if you don't have any. I mean, that's the only way to realize the value of a dollar is when that dollar is not there to be spent. You've got all the dollars in the world at this point compared to where you were as a kid. Mm -hmm. So how do you create that sense of respect when mm -hmm. you know it's just a totally different circumstance? And that's a great question. It is tough. Um, and it's it's subtle things that, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, for him to be as respectful as he can, right? And it's the, uh, when we go on vacations or the things that he has at his house, um, just always telling him that, you know, things don't just arrive. You yes. know, money doesn't grow in trees. <laughs> right, yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. You know, somebody that dad works for this. The value yeah. of money. Absolutely. Yeah. And how and, it's earned. And dad expects you to work, too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah like absolutely. what Shaq says, you know, we're not rich. I'm, I'm rich. I'm rich, yeah. <laughs> yeah so. The All-Star Weekend coming up. That's right. I can't wait. You're How does it be feel to be an All-Star, yeah. one of the best in the business? Uh, it's not something I take for granted. I've been blessed to be an All-Star for five years now. I've been able to go to All-Star Weekend every single year. Um, and it's something I grew up watching and wanting to be a part of. And I think it's the perfect platform, right, for this weekend. So, so many eyes are going to be oh, on All-Star Weekend with SoFi announcing their official bank of the NBA. Um, I thought it was the perfect time to announce the you know, generational wealth fund that we're doing with SoFi and yeah. the Jason Tatum Foundation. And how will it work exactly? I know, I, I, I hear the partnership. Can you just, in one sentence, say exactly what the two of you will be doing together? Right, so the million dollars will go to single parent family, um, single parents in St. Louis to help them put a down payment on a house. That's awesome. We all know that wow. to achieve generational wealth, owning a home yeah. is, you know, yes. a vital part of that. So that foundational piece. Accelerating that process. Um, you know, getting back to the NBA, best record in the NBA. You guys are dominant each year. It's always the close but no cigar so far. Uh -huh. um, NBA greats have always had opinions <laughs> on your squad, Charles <laughs> Barkley being one of them. Yes. Um, and he has talked about how this team isn't mentally tough enough. Um, when OGs talk, we listen. You know, that's what athletes do. How do you feel when you hear people criticizing your squad, saying, listen, they'll get close, yeah. but they're never going to win and the you finals. want Gail to take a message yeah. back to Mr. Yeah, Barkley. Yeah, because she worked. Her co-worker. Yes, but does Charles know what he's talking about here, Jason? I mean, you have to give them the respect, right? Those are the guys that paved the way uh, for the younger players like myself. I hear a butt coming. You don't always have to agree, <laughs> yeah. um, but you have, you know, in a sense, respect it because of the work that they put in. And I understand that in the times that we're in, you can't win it. Nobody can win a championship until you do it. So yeah. nobody's going to give us the credit until we actually do it. And that's fine. Um, you know, we don't necessarily pay attention to the outside noise. There's a group of us in that locker room that, you know, go to war with each other every day. Um, and we're up for the challenge. Yeah. yeah. Listen, man, you're one of the best in the business, yeah. one of the best leaders, not yeah. just uh, on your team, but in yeah. the NBA. And I love what you're doing off the court right now. Keep doing your thing, man. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Can we Thank say one of the best dressed? Yeah, one of the best <laughs> dressed, too. I had to come correct today. Yeah, yeah looking good, man. Yeah. You always do. Nothing can stop her. She's all the way up. That's actor Camila Mendez. We could say that about her. She's known for her performances in movies and TV shows. You've seen her. Riverdale, Do Revenge, and Dangerous Lies. Now, Mendez is starring in the romantic comedy. It's called Upgraded. She plays Anna, ambitious intern. An ambitious intern. We like that. In the art world, trying to impress her very demanding and not-so-nice boss. In this clip, Anna gets upgraded to first class on a work trip to London when she meets, of course, a handsome stranger, and then she tells... A little bitty white lie. I work for an auction house here in the city, and our London branch has called in the director of the New York office to save the day. The director? Mm-hmm. Well, wow, that's, that's impressive. Yeah, I guess. <clears throat> Forgive me for this. I'm, you seem a bit young to be the director. <laughs> <laughs> what? Do you get that a lot? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I do. Well, it's probably because I'm, like, the youngest director in company history. 
Yep, sister girl, double down. Uh, 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 <laughs> Congratulations, executive producer Thank and movie you. star of the movie. Thank you so much. So you read the script and you thought, I gotta play her, why? Because it, this little white lie really does spiral out of control. Yes, um, I mean, I was an intern once yeah. for a talent agency, so in some ways I can relate. But also, I wanted to play her because I just find her to be so ambitious and passionate about her work, and I feel the same way about acting, so. What, t t talk about that. You feel the same way about acting, what do you mean? Passionate and? Yeah, I just feel like, I mean, I've known that I've loved acting ever since I was like five years old, so. Uh -huh. I never had to go through that phase of like, what do I want to do? do? Yes. Um, it was very clear to me that I wanted to be an actor. Um, so I've always been very headstrong about that goal. There's a great line in the movie where it says, chance moments can change the course of your life, which mm -hmm. is what happened to Anna in that movie. Yeah. Do you relate to that too? Because this seemed to be a lot of chance moments after chance moments and how she handles the success that she's going to get on this job. Yeah, I definitely relate to that. I think chance moments happen all the time that changed the course of my life, and this movie is a big example of that. Let's talk about rom-coms. Uh, I'm a big rom-com fan. Too. I love it. We all are. We I, all I are. love rom-coms. Rom -com. yes. it's, it's an art form, and not everyone pulls it off. Uh, you have upgraded. is fantastic. Thank uh, you. And as a fan of the genre, were you going into it a fan of the genre? Was a rom-com a thing you wanted 100%. to A hundred percent. And I think there's like, you know, people always love to talk about rom-coms from the 90s, and people are very nostalgic towards that, so Anytime I do a rom-com, I'm really trying to hone in on what was so magical about rom-coms in the past. And I think a huge part of it is having chemistry, having good witty banter between the characters yeah. and trying to keep it as you know, nuanced as possible. I think rom-coms have sort of gotten very cookie cutter these days. Yes. Um, and it's, it's nice to try to find how you can be a little different and break away from that mold. Well, you did that because it's, I, I didn't find it cliche. It took a lot of different twists and turns yeah. to see how it was gonna turn out for Anna and Chance meeting with the, with the guy in the first class lounge. Yeah. Flying first class, it was also nice for her to be able to do that considering yeah. the circumstances that got her there. Exactly. So you talk about rom-coms and the ones that you like. What are your top three? And as an executive producer, how did you go about talking to the cast, the crew, about avoiding some of those cliches and mistakes people have made? Let's see, my favorite rom-coms, I mean, the answer changes every day. Like it does but, probably for everybody. Um, yeah. I love How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Oh, I knew yeah. I mean, I, I feel I like it's a cliche answer. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I mean, I rewatched it in the summer, it's fantastic. I, yeah. I rewatch it all the time, and Kate Hudson is just such a great lead yes. in that movie, and Matthew McConaughey, like the two of them are so it's funny. and chemistry. Every scene is so memorable, too. Um, but yeah, I think that's, you know, going back to what I was saying before, like, I don't think people chemistry read actors enough anymore. I feel like it's very, you know. Uh, you, get, you get the job on Zoom, right? Yeah, you get the job on Zoom, or it's just like a straight offer to that guy, a straight offer to that girl, and you know, they'll meet the day before they film. And I've done that, and it works, and I did that with Upgraded. I hadn't met him in person when we shot, until we shot the movie. So, I mean, it's definitely different now, but I do think that was why so many rom-coms yeah. back a, then were so magical. A lot of people know you from Riverdale. Those days are over for you now. What will you take away from that experience? I love the TikToks that you all do <laughs> with your former castmates. But now you were, you've moved on and, and, and clearly still flourishing. What will you Thank take you. from that part of your career? Um, so much. It was like an acting boot camp, yeah. you know, because we were, I mean, fun, yeah. shows like that don't really exist and may not ever exist in that way. You know, teen shows, teen network shows that just kind of go for years and years. That's so, um, I don't know, I don't think that happens much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel very grateful that I had that experience of being able to show up every day yes. and do what I love and, and learn yeah. and grow and develop my skill set. Um, it taught me so many technical things that um, I realize when I go on other projects, I'm like, oh, I learned that because of Riverdale. Yes, and now we can mm -hmm. say you've learned to be an executive producer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> very, very well. I'm loving the red with the chocolate brown. Thank you so much. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank Continued you. Continued success, Camila Mendez. Thank you Turn so you much. On, always. We got the magicians Penn and Teller here live as well. They have performed together for almost 50 years, wow. a half century, and they have wow. revolutionized the Modern Magic Show, superstars of the longest running headlining act in the history of Las Vegas.
It's a fan favorite residency at the Rio All Suite Hotel and Casino. And for 10 seasons on TV, they've been hosting the hit magic series, Penn and Teller Fool Us, one of my favorite yes. shows on television. Fool Us. Penn, Gillette, and Teller, good morning to both of you. Good morning. It's good a real morning. honor to meet you, honestly. I'm so morning. happy you're here. So nice really appreciate it. Now, last night, uh, Nate and I were in an extreme high rollers poker game, and uh, <laughs> I took home the pot, which included an NFL Super Bowl ring. I'm proud of you, Tony. real deal. I'm proud of you, man. I know when to hold them. I know when to fold them. Oh, Have you ever held one of those uh, Super Bowl rings? Not before? until that victory. This is from last year's Super Bowl. Yep, that's a real one. Now, it's a real one. I'm going to hand it to you. And, you know, we got to see these because we just did a USO tour with Vince uh, Wilfork, and he has five of those, as wow. you know. And he uh, he had a former uh, patriot, right? Yeah, He's yeah. only got four now. That's the yeah, one I want. Just hold that, just <laughs> like just that. Hold that. And, oh. Uh, we got a rose for you too here. Do you oh, want me to hold the rose too? Just, to, just no, You're going to hold that side of the rose, Tony. Would you hold that I'll side hold, of okay. the rose? Okay. Yeah, hold it, hold it nice and firmly there. All right. Now, would you hold this side of the hold rose? This side. Okay. Right hold there. this side. Okay. Right there. Hold it right there. And I'm holding hold the right ring. down there. Now you saw that ring you won in the poker game. Yeah. Yep. That's an actual Super Bowl ring. Watch this. You're holding it right there. You've got both ends. Hold it tightly. Okay, Ready? Hold on. One, two, three. Okay. Wow. And as you can see, the ring is right yeah. there wow. on the rose. You're holding that. And I was old holding time. it is the whole right? time. Yes. And you were holding that, and you were holding see? the ring. Yes. And there it is right there. And that is indeed your is... Super Bowl ring. Right okay, there. that's that's good, guys. And you can keep the uh, rose. I, I, I don't believe you I don't know you how you did it. I turned into a child when it comes to magic. I was magic. holding it the whole time. I'm you were? The whole time. I'm trying to maintain my profession. I love magic, okay. and I love you guys. <laughs> so... Much, so you guys blew our minds already. I don't even know what to do moving forward. Huge fans, huge fans. So, what is the secret to success between the two of you? I know, tell her, you don't tell much, you don't talk. It's part of the act. <laughs> yeah. Pen, what's I the secret? I don't know. You know, we just, it's all we ever wanted to do was do magic for people, so we're very happy doing it. We also like to write new stuff. And, How do you uh, come up with new yeah. tricks? Well, we just, uh, just brute force. We just sit in a room till we get an idea. You know? oh. uh, but you said you wanted to make it intellectually and emotionally fun. What does that mean? Speaking to the microphone. Okay. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, magic is is an odd form because it is more intellectual than music or even comedy mm -hmm. because you have to understand what the rules of the world are and be able to think about what's different about it, you know? But how did you two get together? Were you old friends? And how did you decide you're going to speak and you are well, not going to speak? We didn't get to be old friends until about 40 years ago. <laughs> really? We started out young friends. Uh, <laughs> we, we met through a mutual friend. Uh -huh. Tell it was a... High school Latin teacher Latin in teacher. Trenton, New Jersey. Okay. And oh, I was out, a uh, shout out to Jersey. Yeah. street and, juggler. And you were? A street juggler. Street, okay. Yeah. And my choices were essentially work with Penn and Teller or go to prison. I had no other skills <laughs> at all. <laughs> and uh, we started uh, we started doing shows together. Now, Teller was already working silently. Oh, uh, he was already. So I had nothing to do with Teller. Because he can actually speak. He can, It's yeah, just part yeah, of your, yeah. your routine. As a matter of fact, as soon as we're done here, he'll be yapping <laughs> he will, his head off. He will say some words. <laughs> so when it comes to longevity, um, working together, it seems like you guys enjoy each other. Yeah. But it's not always easy, I assume. No, it's not. But we really see it as a business partnership. Mm. And I think when you start out, I mean, I, you said we started as friends. We really did. We started did? out yeah. thinking we'll be able to do Partners. better stuff together than we could separately. separately. So we're kind of like yeah. two guys who go into work. And I think that makes it a lot easier. You also talked about the evolution of magic. Um, yeah. And now you have technology, cell phones. Mm -hmm. It's not the same where mm -hmm. 100 people can walk into a room without any technology, and it's an intimate space between you and the performer. And the secrets yeah. the secrets are easier to tell for other which people. Is, which is wonderful. The, like fact, Why do you say that? the fact that the secrets are on the internet stops it from being all old white guys doing magic. Oh, wow. Because those secrets have opened up in the past 10 years, and with Fool Us, we've worked very, very hard to make sure there are magicians that don't look like us. So diversity and, and inclusion. Wasn't... Yes. That's and it, awesome. Because are, are you tired of old white guys? You, I'm no, 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 you weren't talking to me. No, I am. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, hey, you trying to get me canceled, man? That's, no, you are. That's so funny. He looked at you. Are you tired of old white guys? <laughs> Listen, I watched you guys last night at NFL Honors. They did a trick with Commissioner Roger Goodell. Yeah. And yeah. Keegan told me backstage that that was what he was most worried about during the show, that that, that, that would go 
wrong. He did a good job. Yeah, he, he yeah, had, yeah. He had more to do than we like to let people yes. know. Yes. <laughs> I mean, do you ever worry when you have prominent people on stage that, oh, gosh, please, praying to sweet black baby Jesus that it works? <laughs> Has it ever not gone well? Well, yeah, we've had, we've had, we've done everything wrong you could possibly do. Have you? But when we work with people that, uh, that are celebrities, they're, they're all good. Yeah. You know, but what's interesting good. is you didn't give us any advance warning. I wasn't even sure what was happening with the yeah. trick. Did you guys know? No, we just walked I over here from the other just set. just walked yeah. over here. That's what I think. They didn't that's why we think it's risky. And that's what why I, I loved it, though. Wrong. Yes. It is risky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, you're so trying to make sure you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, you're the most famous magicians in Vegas, longest running show in Vegas of any kind, but you're also basically Vegas tour guides at this point. You've been here, you know here. A lot of people are coming for the Super Bowl for yeah. the very first yeah. time. What would you tell them about what makes Vegas so special? What makes Vegas so special is just this, you know, this mile this strip. right along here. There's more entertainment here than there is any place else in the world. You know, mm. you can see you can see all kinds of shows all the time. And that's really changed. In the past 30 years, we've gone from a place that people went to, ironically, yeah. you know, to kind of make fun of the shows and yes. make fun yeah, of the yeah. restaurants. Yes. And now there's actually good restaurants, and I, I hope people think there are good shows. Yeah. yeah, well, we appreciate you guys are living legends. As a kid who grew up on magic and as an adult who still loves it, thank you. Go Great see the show. Yeah. No doubt about it. the rose with an invisible sword. It's yeah. amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> Shaheen Sanchez, who is deaf, masterfully interpreted Usher's medley of music. He's a self-taught professional dancer, choreographer, and, like all of us, a longtime Usher fan. Shaheen joins us right now with his interpreter, Kayla Cornish. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Well, thank you for joining us. Now, I want to start with you, Shaheem. Uh, you are a longtime Usher fan, like we all are. What did this opportunity mean to you? This opportunity to me, it was lit, honestly, because before, I actually taught Usher sign language before. So he actually learned really fast. So this was an amazing opportunity to actually meet again with him to meet with him at the halftime show to perform with him. So, I mean, we weren't expecting that, but it was a dope experience for me. Nice, so he's a fast learner. Um, hopefully I can learn fast too, because I want to learn as well. Um, now you've been doing choreography for 10 years. What do you like about Usher's music? Well, my first favorite thing about Usher is his song Climax, actually. Yeah, it's fire. That's always my favorite song to sign, so I've always signed that song. Um, then maybe other signs, like You Make Me Wanna. I mean, there's a lot of different songs. But I'm actually more of an R&B soul type of guy when I'm dancing and performing, so those are my favorite types of extra songs. I like that. You know, the Super Bowl stage is one of the biggest stages in the world. Um, what do you hope that last night's performance does for the deaf community. My performance won because they see it. So this year they chose me. It's going to hit different because we're actually making history because last year it was more of like just like interpreting. So this year we have more of a performance. There's dancing and signing, breaking that into one to show that it's a show, not just me interpreting. So that was different. I'm a deaf performer, not a deaf interpreter. I mean, I've never seen that before. When deaf people were looking at me like, dang, wow, I've never seen that before. I've never seen it before. And we need more deaf people like this to perform for us. So the concept of, you know, this halftime show bringing both worlds together. So, for example, we have Usher and we have her, right? So we use Angel as her to show her or as Alicia Keys. Yeah. So the whole time I was okay. Usher, right? But then um, Angel was coming back and forth in as different characters, Alicia Keys and her. And you have said that being deaf has made you a better dancer. How so? Me being deaf made me a better dancer. Me being deaf being a better dancer. So I feel the music. So... Of course, you know, I have to feel the bass. I have to feel the powerful music, right? So, I mean, you can't just have the music low. So that's what makes me a better dancer, to feel the music. But I'm not going to say I'm better than everybody. But, you know, I know I'm good. I know I'm one of the best. But 
I'm, I'm not the best. Well, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much. And we can all feel the music and the passion. Shaheem Sanchez and Kayla Cornish, thank you. Now, in the final moments of last night's game, it was wide receiver McCole Hardman Jr. holding that ball after that clutch catch for a touchdown. Hopefully, he's got a little bit of sleep. I think not, but that's okay. McCole Hardman Jr. joins us right now from the Fountain Blue Hotel in Las Vegas. Good morning and congratulations. What's up, baby? How you doing? What's up, man? How you doing, man? Appreciate you. Of course, I appreciate you. Now, listen. That moment last night is what kids dream of. It's overtime. It's the Super Bowl. Coach calls a play. Quarterback rolls out. He finds me in the end zone. But you said last night that you blacked out. What do you remember from that moment? <laughs> you know what? I remember, I remember everything up until um, after the catch. So basically, I knew the play call. I knew the corner dropped back. I knew that, you know, it, it was the ball was going to come to me. But when I caught the football, I'm telling you, like, I completely just, like, was lost in reality. And then finally, I just seen Pat running to me and just like, but you a champion. You know that, right? I'm like, oh, yeah. And then that's when the celebration started. McCall, it's Tony DeCopo here in New York. Let's take a step back to where you began this season. You were a New York Jet. It didn't look like you were going to have a, a chance to catch this play in the Super Bowl. Now you did. Talk about the emotional journey from one team back to the Chiefs where you have won two prior Super Bowls and now a third. Yeah, that was, that was a crazy journey, man. Uh, definitely a roller coaster up and down. Um, being with the Jets, you know, definitely, you know, had different visions there. Uh, and things went how they went there, and uh, but just happy that you know the Chiefs were you know thought of me just to you know bringing me back and um, were trade to get me back, and um, that's a testament to Veach. And now we're here winning the Super Bowl, so I, I guess you know everything happened like it's supposed to. Yeah, exactly. I was supposed to. McCall, it's Gail King in New York. We're back here, but we were in the stadium last night. Here's a question: You guys had a very rough first half. What was said in the locker room? Because you all came out and it was a totally different ball game. What was said to you in the locker room that changed the game? Well, you know, it was a real long halftime, but uh, Trav definitely, um, he set the fire on everybody. Um, definitely came with a, a passion speed at halftime, you know, um, like how Trav does. He flipped a few yes. things over, you know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he definitely had a good speech to us to just to get, get everybody going and definitely got a few to the fire. And we came by the second half um, just, you know, doing better than we did in the first half, so. Yeah, there's a great picture of Travis and Taylor where you all see each other after that moment that we're showing right now on the screen. What, what, were, the, what were you all saying to each other? I love this shot of you guys. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, just uh, me and Trav actually having a moment, man, just, you know, saying, you know, how much we appreciate each other. And obviously Taylor was there as well. Um, and she was just saying congrats and, you know, um, uh, yeah, congratulations, basically. You know, so yeah. but that's definitely a good moment right there. Yeah. And the, the, last year, we remember after McCall. the Super Bowl, your your partner went into labor. You now you all had a baby. And now yeah. I think your baby turns either one today or yesterday, today or tomorrow. Yeah, my baby turn. Uh, he turns one um, the thirteenth, so tomorrow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So tell us what this is like. This past year is like, and is his name McCole Hardman the third? Yes, he's the third. Yes, man, yeah. he is. Of course he is. Of course he is. So what's the past year been like? You got a Super Bowl and right. you got a baby boy. Yeah, uh, actually, we got another one on the way as well that's doing May. Oh. Um, I have a daughter coming in that's, that's doing May. <laughs> coming in. So, um, but yeah, coming it's, it's, in. I know, right? It's, it's been a, yeah, I know. It's, it's been a roller coaster, man. Um, I, you know, um, getting to New York, you know, trying to get a new place and then that don't work out and got to come back to KC and get a new place. Just was a roller coaster up and down, but um, you know I won't have no um, no other way. Definitely win the wow. Super Bowl and you know get a chance to actually come back. So it's definitely um, was a good journey. McCall, good to be you. McCall, yeah, very good to be you, McCall Hartman. Uh, you know, three Super Bowl rings, uh, a new child on the way, uh, a birthday tomorrow to celebrate. <laughs> a lot going on in your life. Congratulations, my friend. I pre appreciate it. Thank you.
The Nashville-based musician won her first Grammy, thank you very much, Best American Roots performance for her song, Eve Was Black. But the celebration soon turned to controversy in her home state. How come? During a routine legislative session, two separate resolutions were put forward in the Tennessee House to honor Russell and fellow home state band that would be Paramore for each winning Grammys. But House Republicans blocked the resolution to honor Russell while allowing the resolution for Paramore to pass. What's up with that? Paramore's lead singer, that's Haley Williams, called the move, quote, blatant racism. In a statement, Republican caucus chair, that's Jeremy Fison, told CBS Mornings, quote, members routinely come to me with questions about items on the consent calendar, which was the case for this particular resolution. But he did not elaborate on what those questions were. Alison Russell is with us at the table, and we just want to say first, congratulations, congratulations. on your Grammy win. Yeah, Despite win. all of this controversy and kerfuffle oh. surrounding what should have been a symbolic, ceremonial, celebratory move in yeah. your honor, turn to this. So when you first heard about it, where, where were you and what did you think? I was actually on an airplane. I, I missed hearing about it till I landed. I was on an airplane coming back from Montreal, Quebec, where I was part of one of the uh, oldest, longest running shows in, in Quebec called Tout le monde en parle. And mm -hmm. I was so excited that I'd been on the show that Céline Dion had been on. And yes. Coming home to Nashville to my daughter and I got off the plane and my phone started blowing up. And I actually got a call from Representative Jones, uh, Justin Jones, Justin Jones. Uh -huh. who is just brilliant representative for District 52 in, in Tennessee, freedom fighter, one of the Tennessee yeah, three. Yeah, we know him. Yeah. But Allison, when you hear that Paramore is going forward and yours is not, yeah. were you hurt? Were you angry? What, what do you think the reason is? Uh, you know, unfortunately, there's a pattern of behavior that's pretty blatant. I think it goes beyond dog whistle, whether uh, their issue with me is that I'm black or that I'm queer or that I'm an immigrant uh, to the U.S. I don't know. Maybe none of the above, but one can speculate that has mm -hmm. something to do with it mm -hmm. based on the way the, the J Justin Jones and Justin Pearson have been treated by that same mm -hmm. uh, caucus chair, mm -hmm. um, by the way that uh, T.J. Osborne's from the brother Osborne, About, yes. th the same representative had an issue mm -hmm. with his uh, honoring T.J., who is the first uh, man in, mm -hmm. in mainstream country to come out. To come out. Right. Um, yeah. We did get a, a statement from uh, Rep. Uh, Faison, and he points out that Democrats in the same week bumped similar resolutions honoring middle school teachers, a U.S. combat veteran, and an entire elementary school essentially saying these kinds of things happen all the time. Mm -hmm. What do you, how do you take that? Well, actually, that? he puts a sharper point on it. I think it's interesting. He says, look, some Democrat bumped schools and veterans, and we didn't leap to the conclusion that they're anti-veterans or anti-schools. Right. And so they're accusing you of leaping to this racism charge when they're just saying, look, this is the way things I go. I actually didn't make a racism charge. I responded to um, Representative Jones' video and statement about what had happened. I watched yeah, the Paramore speaker. Yeah, it about racism. I watched the yeah. speaker. And Justin Jones called it Jim Crow. Yes. I watched the speaker turn off Representative Jones' mic when he was clearly making an announcement while gaslighting him to say he wasn't making an announcement. I mean, anyone can go watch it. I, I don't want to personally spend too much time shining a light on what they're doing. I've, the, the, the reality is that they have been in, because they have a so-called supermajority, which I want to point out, isn't actually a supermajority. We are, th we have less than 32% of our population showing up to vote. Mm -hmm. We are 49th Traffic. in the country in That's terms right. of voter turnout. To vote. So yeah. it's not a supermajority, it's that we need to motivate and, and encourage and empower our, the voters in Tennessee to show up at the polls. Can we wanna... celebrate your Grammy win? Yeah, or... yeah. 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 because that's what we're yes. we'll talk about, your music. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. What that felt like you, for you, your first Grammy, and by the way, you were on stage with Joni Mitchell, drop the microphone, but talk about that first Grammy win, what that meant to you. It was incredibly uh, uplifting and shocking. I, shocking? Yes, I did mm -hmm. not, never in a million years did I think I would hear my name called and my song, Eve Was Black, uh -huh. honored in that way. Um, and it honors my whole circle of collaborators, the whole Rainbow Coalition. And it was, it was a frantic, hectic day where we were rehearsing with Joni on the telecast and then running through the tunnels in the underground <laughs> of the complex to get to the premiere ceremony. I didn't even have shoes on when I ran up to the podium. But it was joyful. And I think about Mavis Staples. I think about the shoulders we're standing on. She was 
in her, what, 72, 73, when she won her first Grammy. Mm -hmm. um, and she, so many artists that have come before have kicked the doors open for an artist like me who in the past would have probably fallen between the yeah. cracks of genre mm -hmm. to be recognized. And I'm grateful to the Americana community for that. Yes. I'm grateful to Brandy Carlisle for that. Um, Jason Isbell, Brandy Clark, like we've all kind of come into the recording academy world under the wings of the Americana community, which is really doing the DEI work. And so. your great friends with Rihanna Giddens, who's on yeah. Beyonce's song. I, know. <laughs> I you fell you song. over when I, because I. Did she tell you she was Rihanna on? Rihanna had mentioned that she was maybe going to collaborate, but I didn't hear anything more. And that was, that was probably two years ago. And I thought I didn't, you know. I, but I heard the first notes of the banjo. And you knew. On Texas Hold'em. And that's you knew Rhiannon's that's her banjo. That's great. Nobody <laughs> sounds like her. Nobody sounds like my sister Rhiannon. And, you know, it, she plays this incredible fretless. It's a replica of an 1850s minstrel banjo. It's incredible. Allison, well, can we say nobody you. sounds like you either? Yeah, uh, your incredible you. voice. We're going to let go of the controversy. Thank Just know we're yeah. cheering you on and congratulations. congratulations. Huge very so happy to see you. Huge congrats. Thank you. And I love your suit. <laughs> Thank you. I love your dress. I'm going to be taking pictures glasses. of that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, let me get this straight. It allows for hearsay as long as a murder is established. And a murder is established here because there's a hearsay statement that establishes it. I mean, tell me when the snake actually devours its tail, okay? I just love her. That's actress Carrie Preston in the hit series A Good Wife. She won an Emmy, by the way, for playing the quirky, unconventional lawyer Elsbeth Tassioni. Preston is reprising her role in the new CBS spinoff series, Elspeth. It's so good. She's taking on a new job as an investigator with the NYPD. In this clip, she questions a popular theater director. Is he popular? Who she suspects could be involved in the death of a student. Wow. Are all these your students? Many of them, yes. <gasps> I think she was in Wicked. <laughs> I only know because I have the cast album. I play it all the time. How may I help you, Miss Tassioni? Well, the police are looking for who Olivia was dating. What deodorant do you use? What? It's just that we found old Irish deodorant in Olivia's medicine cabinet. And her parents said Olivia didn't use old Irish. So we're looking for a murderer who smells like old Irish. <laughs> yes, OK, you're right. That's like a Sherlock Holmes story, but with scratch and sniff. <laughs> I'm sorry if I can't. Ah, we're very happy to say that Carrie Preston joins us first on CBS Mornings. Welcome, welcome. I love this character. Thank you so because, much. I uh, so I came show. in the other day and I said, she so reminds me of, of Columbo because she has this easygoing kind of delivery and you, you think it's just sort of, oh, by the by, uh -huh. but she's really getting information. Absolutely. And when they first offered me this part 14 years ago on The Good Wife, yes. that's how they described her. Oh, did they? Okay. A female Columbo. Yeah, who's, who's often underestimated. But let's talk about 14 years ago. Yes. Because you were playing her on The Good Wife. What's it like now, though, Carrie? Because you are number one on the call <laughs> sheet. Let's yes. talk about that. It's very exciting. You know, I mean, I played this role about 20 times over The Good Wife and Good Fight uh -huh. universes. And now to get to play her every day, all day long, is such a dream. And I, I am just approaching it with such a hefty amount of gratitude, uh -huh. you know, and, and also humility, you know, to be trusted with uh, the lead of a show, the title character, it's um, almost a, a miracle in my life. Did you dream of having your own show when you started? You know, Why do you call it a miracle in your life? Well, because it's, it's a miracle when anybody gets to do this. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a, it's a tough business. So I feel like for me, it is, um, you know, a, a, a true, you know, milestone. It's like something that I didn't, I didn't dream uh -huh. about. Yes. I've had an incredible career of being a supporting actor, uh, playing leads in small movies, that kind of Saw thing. Saw you in The Holdovers. Thank well, you. Yeah, that, that was great. Yes, yes. Thank you, you were. So yes, yes, yes. But, you know, this, to, to reach this is... Um, is something that I, I it's not lost on me because mm. I've been doing it for so long. Bravo. Yeah. You were doing True Bloods and you took a break from True Bloods to do the guest, the walk-on role initially uh, that led yes. to all of this. Uh, yes. And one of your True Bloods co-stars, Stephen Moyer, is uh, in a guest role. That was Stephen that you just saw in that clip. What's it like reuniting with him? It was wonderful. You know, I we were, we worked on that series for seven years. We had such a chemistry as a, as a group. And so when you're doing a pilot, you know, the pressure is on to make mm -hmm. it great. So having him in that pivotal role really eased 
me up. It, it, it made me feel more relaxed. I had a history with the hem. And so we played together, and I think you can see that crackle on the screen. But you say that her, uh, Elspeth, um, she's underestimated, and you call that her superpower. Yes, why, yes. How, why? Well, because uh, nobody sees her coming. Nope, they don't. She's, uh, she has a bit of a scatterbrain, but I think of her as just extremely present and capable of taking in a lot of information at once. A hyper-awareness so of her surroundings. She has a hyper-awareness of everything. So it might seem like she's scatterbrained, but she's really just collecting the intel mm -hmm. that she's going to use, you know, mm -hmm. to crack the case. Mm -hmm. So Elsbeth go, goes from Chicago to New York. You're familiar with New York. I uh, love New York. I've years, lived here yeah. for 34 years. Wow. 34 years. Yes. Now, um, doing the show set in New York, does this allow you to see this city with a fresh pair of eyes? That is the best thing about playing Elsbeth, is she just leads her life with curiosity and wonder. So when I'm out in New York and I'm shooting, I'm seeing the city through her eyes, ah. as if I'm a tourist. We had a scene where we were at the top of a tour bus, hmm. and so seeing the, the city from that level. You're lost in the character. It was so wonderful because it made me appreciate and have curiosity and wonder about my life. And I'm hoping that that's what the show that's will That's fascinating. Be. I know, think so too. Will we get joy. To, we didn't get to really know her backstory or her back life. Will we get to know more about her backstory in this, now that you are number one on the call sheet? <laughs> Number one yes. walking. Yes, number, number one, one walking. Number one walking, I know, I know. It, it gives me chills every time still. Um, yes, you're going to learn about her son, which we only heard about at the very first time we ever saw Elsbeth. Now we're going to hear about him. His name is Teddy. We're going to learn a little bit about him. Now, whether or not we're going to meet him, I'm not sure. Your husband's an actor, too. Yeah. Do you possibly see Michael Emerson on this show? Ooh. I would love if Michael came on the well, show. Well, you know people, number one, <laughs> walking. <laughs> yes, I do know people. And we've had incredible guest stars already. Yes. You know, yeah. we had Steven. We had Jesse Tyler Ferguson, Retta, Blair Underwood, well, Jane Krakowski. They only gave us you, one episode. Do you tell them to act one. right, and, and I'll do something for you? Yeah. That's right. I know. We hook each other up. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Kerry. Yeah. Thank Congratulations. you so much yeah, for that, having me. Terrific in this. Please Show's know great. we're cheering you on. You have to have this dinner party. Why do you do this with these for dinner fun. parties? What is this compulsion to have people over your house and serve them it's food and, and talk to them? It's fun. What a it's strange a little thing. gathering, a little huh? party. Why, why can't you just uh, lighten up and, and have a good time? People from Brooklyn don't walk around <laughs> like that. <laughs> we are in California. Of course, that is Cheryl Hines and Larry David from the first season of Curb Your Enthusiasm nearly 25 wow. years ago. The final episode of HBO's hit series will drop in April. Of course, Cheryl Hines plays David's wife, now ex-wife. Uh, in this clip from Sunday's new episode, Larry asks her for a favor. So they renovated the temple and they have this plaza and they were selling these bricks for charity and Hobie Turner wrote something very defamatory about me and it's there for everyone to see. It says, Larry David is disrespectful to women. Come on, Cheryl, I'm not disrespectful. I love women. Who loves women more than me? I love having sex with them. I love talking to them. I'm mm -hmm. a champion of women. Being a champion to women is Well, it means I'm attracted to women. I like them. <laughs> okay, there, there's a difference, okay. So I'd like to refute his brick by having somebody who I know write something nice about me. On the brick? Yes, I was married to Larry David for many years, and he's a veritable champion of women. Something like that, right next to it. They'll read his first, they'll read your second. You buy a brick. <clears throat> I don't think so. Why not? Uh, it, it doesn't feel right. What is, uh, what is this material? Yes. So, Her expression. So good. Like Cheryl, so yes. good. Cheryl Hines is with us first yes. on CBS Mornings. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. So um, that scene, right? Mm. You were saying something to me in the green room, which is that we know the show is improvised. Yeah. It's ending now. Um, those moments where Larry comes in and he describes something to you, you're reacting in real time to that because it's all improvised. Yes, it's all improvised. Like, give us an idea about how it works. Improvise, how, like, so, what, what, in, what instructions do you get? So, that scene, they might say, Larry's gonna come in and ask Cheryl for a favor. Uh-huh. And you don't know, and you what, don't the know what the favor is. No, I don't know what the favor is. Okay. So it's, then I sit down and I'm listening, and it's like, okay, that doesn't... <laughs> That's so you could go any any direction. You could yeah. say he is a champion of yes. women. Or oh, right, I could. <laughs> yes. I could, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so you just, and, and there's no rehearsals. You know, usually 
when you're shooting a TV show, everybody has a script and and they rehearse for the camera crew. And yeah, but for Curb, there are no rehearsals. And even if the camera crew needs to see where we're going to be sitting or standing, we'll just speak gibberish. We'll be like a da 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 da. Peas and carrots. Peas and, and yeah. carrots. But might what's sit it down. like though, Cheryl, working like that, where you don't know what the next line's going mm. to be, and you have to react in real time? I would think. That would have you on your toes all of the time. Well, yeah, you're definitely on your toes. Yeah. But it's so, I don't know, it, it's easy. Uh -huh. it, it's easy because you can't even imagine that people survive. all you have to do is listen. Yes. You know, and respond. That, uh, and know who your character is and who he is and who, who the other Yeah, we all know who he is. We yeah, all know we know who he is. makes the show so good. Are you ready for it tonight? Because I watched again on Sunday. I've mm -hmm. watched from the very beginning. Me too. Me too. Again. I, I've, watched, to, I've, I've, I've watched every episode of every me season. Too. And when, and when Sam too. Kulak, our producer, said, do you want the screeners? I'm like, no. No. Because I'm already, already caught up. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for it to end? I think for a lot of us, it's like, no, we're not ready. I Even know. though he took a break in the middle. Yeah. yeah. I'm not really ready. I'm not ready. Wow. Although, I mean, that being said, I'm still, I'm, I feel so fortunate that we've come this far, and there was a season when I got a call from Larry saying, good news and bad news. Good news is we're gonna do another season, mm -hmm. and the bad news is you're not gonna be in it. Oh, uh, because Yeah, so it's like, well, that's really more <laughs> bad news. <Yeah. laughs> Where is the good news again? <laughs> um, but, so, but so I have had years of not being in it, mm -hmm. or the show wasn't shooting, so. It's it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. I'm gonna miss it, but I've also had years where I missed it. Yeah. So it's like yeah. it sort of comes and goes yeah. in my life. One of the um, I, the the season six episode, the TiVo guy, which is one of my favorite episodes of the season, where Larry is arguing with the TiVo guy, and Cheryl's in a plane, and she thinks the plane's about to crash, so yes. she calls Larry yes. to you know get some you know comfort. final words, some comfort, and Larry hangs up on her because he's dealing yes. with the TiVo guy. That was based on a true story. Wait, what? So I told Larry this story. I said, but I have a friend who was in a plane. Uh, the landing gear wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And they started circling to dump fuel because yes. they were expecting a crash landing. Yes. Yes. And everybody called home because they were like, this is not looking good. Yeah. And she called home to her husband and he said, I, I, I got to go. I, I've been waiting for this technician all day. And she said, no, I just want to listen. We're going down. I want to tell you I love you. He's like, I, I got to call you back. I, I'm going to have to call you back. And she was so furious yes, at her husband. Yes. And I told Larry that story. And then the next thing I know, we're doing it. And I get, and we get divorced yeah. over it. Right. That's the that's like, lead. Uh, that, 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 I think that yeah. that could be grounds. <laughs> the other part of your life, you're married to Bobby Kennedy Jr. Yes. He's running for president. Yes. Some of his views are considered controversial. I'm wondering, how do you handle that? Are you in sync about how he feels about certain things? I I am. I'm in sync with about most of it. Yeah. And then there are other parts where I listen and I, you know, I need to consider that and I want to mm -hmm. think about that. But what I love about Bobby running, well, what I love about Bobby, he's very smart. He's mm -hmm. very... Um, and you're campaigning, stop. Cheryl. You're out there campaigning. I, I get out there. I get out there every mm -hmm. once in a while and meet the people who I love. We were just talking yeah, about this. Yeah, yeah, I do it's too. A, love the people. The, the great thing about Bobby and, and his campaign is he's really uh, bringing Republicans, Democrats, uh, independents together, and they're all in one space. Like thousands and thousands of different people mm -hmm. that are there to listen and not fight with each other, mm -hmm. but to find out what they have in common with each other, which I love. All right, well, I'm gonna miss you on Kirby. I'm Olympics gonna miss you too. Yeah, We're all gonna, gonna miss, miss you. you she did say that maybe someday Larry will bring the show back as I a hope movie so. or something. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Cheryl, uh, so. you're incredible. Loved Thank having you. you on the show. It's such cheering an honor you on all. Absolutely Thank cheering you, you on. You on. Cynthia Nixon, we're very glad to say, is here in the studio. Welcome, Cynthia Nixon. Thank you. Thank you. So Guess much. what I did Saturday afternoon? You I came was to in row G C one eleven. I had to stop myself from saying hi, Cynthia. Because <laughs> what's interesting is how it starts. You were literally 
You and 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 um, Taylor and, Trench and was Taylor, my co-star. Yeah, you, your co-star is the word I was looking for. You guys are on the stage when everybody walks in, and you're sitting there like mannequins. So you hear us all coming in, and yeah. I wonder what that's like for you is you're waiting for the audience to sit down. Well, there is a famous performance artist named Marina Abramovich, and yes. she famously did this piece, the, the Artist is Present, where people would come in and sit opposite her for a minute or an hour or whatever they felt like. So people who are familiar with that piece know that that's sort of a, you know, a reference to and, But yeah. as an audience member, we're going, is that them? Are they real? <laughs> you didn't move. You, we're very still. We're very still. We're very focused on each other. And as you can see in the clip, we're very, you know, we're dressed like each other. I'm yes. wearing a little bit of a of a lift so that I'm almost his height, and uh, you know, there's a kind of a twinness about but the this. The thing is, and you were playing eight different characters. It's 90 minutes, no intermission. Yeah. You're playing eight different characters. Yes. Seven year disappear. You hadn't been on the stage for seven years. Yes, I read this role and you thought what? Well, I thought that the play is fascinating in in so many ways. It's a kind of a mystery. It goes backwards in time, and I play this you know, very um, diva-ish uh, performance artist who disappears for seven years. But I get to play, as you said, all the other people that my son encounters in the, in seven, the seven years, years of my absence. And, you know, your mother is your first relationship, right? So every relationship you have in, 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 in your life is kind of layered on top of your your mother. And so that's, I mean, I think part of the playwright's point. Let's just say mother and son had some things they needed to work out. <laughs> they let's just did. say that. They did. Uh, so, I mean, you kind of answered this, but you say uh, every person is your mother is sort of the theme of the play. <laughs> but I, I imagine you were thinking about your own mother then in... Very, very much so. so. I mean, my, so my mother quit. Well, she was an actress. She was not a successful actress. She quit before I was born. But oh, from a very wow. early age, she took me to, the, you know, I saw my first Shakespeare when I was like six. Um, did you and like it? It's I did, I did. Yeah, wow, you were James, different kind James of James Earl Jones was playing uh, Claudius in Hamlet. Ah. And, you know, and I, he said, you know, he welcomes Hamlet. And, you know, uh, our, our uh, I can't remember the line right now. But, you know, I said, he doesn't mean it. And she was like, oh, that's right. He's being ah. duplicitous. And it was really clear even then. So she really schooled me from a very early really age. Good. And I think that that's one of the parents pass on whatever they can pass on. And in the case of this woman that I'm playing, her parental skills may be a little <laughs> yes. lacking, yes. but she has this great love of and knowledge of how to create art. And she's yeah. just sort yeah. of, you know, main, wow. main, mainlining it into him. Now, as Gail mentioned, uh, two Emmys, two yes. Tonys. Yes. Even a Grammy. Yes. Improbably. So you're an Improbably. Oscar away from the EGOT. Yes. Do you think about it? And do not sit here and say you don't. Because um, you're, you're close. Uh, it's well, within arm's reach. You know, you, cl close is, you know. <laughs> one, there's one more box to be checked. It's a little difficult box to check. I have to say my, our youngest son is named Max. Max. And he's named for his grandfather. So that's fantastic. But we did, when we were considering names, we did think about naming him Oscar for Oscar oh. Wilde. And also so that we could say we already have him. <laughs> but Cynthia, you've got two hit shows, The Gilded Age and, uh, and Just Like That. Yes. I mean, and, and now, you're on, now you're on the stage again. What is your life like, and how are you juggling all of these things? Well, it's not so bad at so the many. moment. As you said, it's only an hour and a half. It's quite a expenditure of energy and emotion and everything. But, but two hit shows, Cynthia. But two hit shows, right. So that, so this um, this spring and summer and fall, they will be shooting at the same time. So oh, wow. that will be Jeez. a challenge. So you'll be doing Gilded Age, you'll be doing and, Just Like That. And Just Like That. And, and yes. the play? No, the oh, play right. the play okay. only runs through March thirty okay. first. But you all clearly right. still love what you do. I do. You do you clearly still I love do. What and you I do. have to say I love this play so much and I don't know I've done a lot of challenging plays in my time, but none more than this. And wow. that is or as satisfying as this. No, did I mention eight characters in nineteen? <laughs> <Five characters. laughs> That's all I'm saying. Bravo, Cynthia Nixon. Thank Bravo you. to you. Hello, Alberta. Okay. I know that you are mad about the whole my son murdering you and me not telling you about it for a hundred years, but but how long do you intend to freeze me out? Flower, can you please tell Hetty I'm still not talking to her? Hetty, Alberta wants me to tell you that... Wait, I just had it. Never mind. 
Never mind. That's actor Danielle Pinnock in the hit TV show Ghost. Have you seen it? She plays the ghost of Alberta Haynes, a jazz singer from the 1920s. So the highly anticipated third season premieres tonight right here on, where, Vlad? CBS. CBS. The show's about a couple. Sam and Jay are their names. They run a bed and breakfast in upstate New York, and it's filled with ghosts. The ghosts are from all different time periods. At the end of season two, you may remember, a white beam of light is seen outside the mansion, which means that one of the ghosts has ascended to an afterlife, but we don't know who that is. So we spoke with Danielle the other day about the new season and what we can expect, and here's that conversation. I promise we're going to talk about season three, but I have to talk about the Super Bowl because <laughs> during the Super Bowl, I know you watch because I was on oh, yeah. Instagram, but during the Super Bowl, there's a commercial, there was a spot for ghosts. What did you think when you saw that in the Super Bowl with uh, a gazillion people watching? 150 million people saw me. I mean, my family's group text on WhatsApp is blowing up. I got so much cool points with them. It is surreal. Our cast had so much fun filming those promos. Yes. And then the cast group text were like, did y'all see it? Did y'all see it? Oh my God, that's our face, that's our face. It is absolutely fabulous. The other thing, I love you that you live out loud on Instagram. And the thing I got the biggest kick out of was Usher's performance at the Super Bowl. You were doing that in real time. What was that like? What were you thinking? Clearly, you like some Usher. I had Usher's posters all over my wall when I was growing up. Right. And all them little dance moves, the little tick, 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 tick. <laughs> I mean, I had the dancing down. I'm telling you, it's the best cardio workout. And Usher's been doing cardio. We oh, took a shirt I mean, off. I mean, <laughs> listen, everybody had body. Alicia Keys looked good. Her looked good. Everybody I said, had body. Come on, y'all. Everybody had body. <laughs> Shall we talk about season three of Ghost? Yes. Yeah. Because you, Danielle Pinnock, have said it's the best season ever. It is. So why are you saying that about this particular one? Well, so we really get to dig in and dive into the ghost backstories. There are some great ghost powers that we find out about this season. Jay has a whole restaurant that he's renovating in the barn that we just found. I'm telling you, some of these episodes have made me cry. Oh. They are heartwarming. Mm. They're so funny. And I do think it is the best season yet by far. Oh. It's fabulous. I I'm excited. One of my favorite shows on any kind of platform is Ghost. So <laughs> you did I it for Halloween, by the yeah. way. Yeah. That was going around in the group text. We're like, oh, y'all did it. Tony was in the group text oh, with pants off? That group text is hot, okay? <laughs> <laughs> So I love it. And there's a, there were cliffhangers to end season two, yeah. multiple ones. One of them, your character finds out, Alberta finds out, that Hetty, her friend on the show, another ghost, her son uh. was your murderer. So the relationship is fractured. Oh, well, you know, the thing is, these women have been living together for hundreds of years. Yeah. And so as, you know heartbreaking as it was for Alberta, I hope that they will find some resolution. Now, you've said that playing Alberta has given you confidence. Yes. How so? She is so brave and so brassy and just, I just, I'm so proud of her because now we're in Black History Month, but she is an icon of Black history if you really think about it. She mm. would have been with the Ma Rainey's and the Bessie Smiths. Mm. And for me, I am a homebody through and through. You know what I mean? I wear my pajamas. All this glam is usually not me. So for Alberta, she's in her crush velvet. She loves the applause. And yeah. that has also helped me with my confidence as well, too, just playing this character and being like, you know what? Maybe I am cute, you know? <laughs> Maybe I am doing good here. You know, you were telling me before we went on camera, when I went to see you guys backstage, that you were happier than you've ever been. Yes. I assume that your husband Jack plays a role in that. Yes. Shout out to Jack. Shout out to Jack. Yes. Yes. You're always on TikTok. You have hey, a thing Jack. You're Jack how to dance. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Can he dance? You know there's a rumor that says white men can't dance. Can he dance? Well, you know what? I'm going to say that we're working on it. <laughs> we Jack. Got, we got, we, yeah, you know, I, I got, you. We got him on the one yeah, and two. And there's a three in there that pops in sometimes, <laughs> but we're working on it, Miss Hill. We're yeah, but he's a it. dialect coach. He is. Was, so in, in, in addition to a personal relationship, He's helped you professionally. Too, oh, but so I many, so many dialects. Lovely. This dialect on Ghost, I had a woman show called Body Courage where I interviewed over 350 people worldwide about how they felt about their bodies. Oh. And that ranged from a Northern Irish priest to a little girl on the south side of Chicago that was struggling with her weight and so many others. And he was integral in that entire process. I did it for five years. Alberta wears one outfit. All the oh, ghosts just have one right. outfit. Yes. They, they're whatever they died in, right. they are wearing. Yes. You've got your evening wear on. Yes. That can get a little tiring, though, after 100, 100 years or so. Well, <laughs> I'm telling you, it is a glorious costume, crushed velvet. It looks fabulous on camera. Yeah. It does get a little hot, especially in the summertime. But I'm going to tell you, we did do a little costume switch up. The audiences won't see this, but y'all, this season, I got a new girdle, and it is fabulous. <laughs> okay. It is fabulous. I can breathe. I can dance. <laughs> and, like, uh -oh. I was like, this was 
was the best change I could have in season three. So yeah, well, please, the girdle is new. Please help her <laughs> brother out and send me that. <laughs> Always need a good harness. Thank you, Danielle. We are so happy for yeah, your you success. Are crazy. <laughs> we are so happy. You know it's the truth, though. Little. We are so happy for your success, Thank really. You so much. Yeah, Cheering you on always. Thank, Thank you, you for so having much. me. Thank you. This week's studies are all about relationships, specifically romantic relationships. Everybody wants one, especially me. <laughs> I thought I was in one until he told me that his gifts were just Amazon packages because he's my mail man. <laughs> hmm. All right. I can tell when somebody's playing hard to get. <laughs> <laughs> That's comedian and actress Duce Sloan, who has been a correspondent at The Daily Show since 2017. <laughs> She's also part of a Netflix comedy special, an animated TV series, and host of a comedy game show. And now she's releasing a book of personal essays. It's called Hello, Friends, Stories of Dating, Destiny, and Day Jobs. Yeah, like Dude. the alliteration. I there. love yeah. that. Yeah. Welcome. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So you wanted to title the book, uh, uh, Don't Call It a Memoir, I'm Only 39, which is yes. hilarious. And then the publisher was like, no. <laughs> um, you can't call a book something that it's not. And I was like, but it's funny. And they're like, that's cute. Pick another name. Yeah. Uh, so I'm always saying, hello, friends. Um, and so they're like, well, let's just call it that because it sounds fun, it's friendly, and it's inviting as opposed to, hey, don't call this book that. I'm not as old as you think I am. It's from the very first page. I love the dedication to herself. Me too. Because you always wonder about those dedications. I dedicate it to my wife yes. and my kids. And you're like, this book is dedicated and you have it in capital, me. Yes. Because <laughs> you didn't think you could do a book, you said. No, a book is hard. Like, that's like, and this isn't like a thin book. Like, this is a whole book. It's yeah. a whole book. And I don't know if you've ever seen a whole book, but you got to put words in those. <laughs> yes. And they want, like, a lot of them. I didn't count them. That's not my job. But what I will say is that you have to fill it up so they'll pay you. And so it was difficult. Because I was thinking about I had to go over my whole life and all of my 39 years at the time, 40 years. No one knows that I'm 40 because, you know... <laughs> <laughs> but you were very candid in this book. Yes. I, I, I want to riff off of the soundbite we played about dating. Yes. Because you, you take us through your dating history, and the guys have names. The mechanic, the UPS man. Dummy. The dummy. dummy. <laughs> Baby Shook. I think I've met all of these people, by the way. You're welcome. And, yes. <laughs> so you have to get the book to see the stories. But you said, when I meet somebody, I want the man to come fully fixed because you have no time to train or to fix. No, it's like you want... There's so many times, like, as you're, you know, as you're dating, you're getting older, it's like, you know, it's potential. He has potential. Someone has to be fully potential. I don't. <laughs> I can't. Because I just bought a house. I have a car. I take care of my family. So, sir, if you want us to hang out, like, hey, let's go on a trip and you need to get PTO, mm -hmm. I don't, I can't deal with employees anymore. But you also talk, too, about therapy. Because for a long time, in your words, you said therapy was for white people. Like, yes. Uh, like, dogs kissing them on the mouth or people talking back to their parents. Absolutely. That's just not something that black no. people do. No. But you decided that when you went to therapy, it did to, it did prove to be game-changing and life-changing for mm -hmm. you in a good way. It did because, one, I didn't know that it was making a real difference until my friends started noticing. Because they said you need to talk better, nicer to yourself. Yes. You were not doing. Yeah. I had two of my friends say to me one time that lived in completely different parts of the country that said to me, if someone spoke to me the way that I speak to myself, they would fight them. Mm. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. okay, well, don't fight me. Um, but so I had to combat that because I'm very hard on myself and a lot of people aren't. So it was me holding myself to a certain standard, not speaking to myself in a kind way. And so when I started going to therapy, I learned about boundaries, yes. which who knew? <laughs> oh, man, y'all made a mistake telling me about boundaries. Y'all are really messed up. How you know? You idiot. Oh, why would you tell somebody like me about boundaries? Oh, yes. you gave me too much power. Your mom is such a huge part of the book and yeah. a part of your life. I love yes. the story about posting. You got a nine in, in a class and then yes. and, and as a grade, and your mom posted it on the refrigerator. Yes. Just talking about the support that she's given you from the very beginning. Well, um, it was a nine out of a hundred. Out of a hundred, yeah. Y'all right. yeah. laughed about yes. it. Yeah. Right, because it was like, you know, she's, I brought it home because the teacher was like, you have to get this sign. And I was like, I got a nine. She said, out of a 10. I said, no, out of a hundred. <laughs> yeah. And both of us were like, well, why didn't she just give you a zero? Because the woman was like, well, I wanted, you know, the credit for you showing your work. And I was like, but the work was wrong. What? Yes, that's me and her. She got us matching outfits. Nice. That's when she got me a billboard Aww. in El Monte for my birthday. Nice. Um, 
But my mother's always been very supportive. I told her when I was six years old, I wanted to be an actor. And she said, what are you going to do to achieve that? I love it. She is in such a big part of the book. The book's amazing. Yes. Uh, it's called Hello Friends. It's available today wherever you buy your books. Yes. Uh, this has been like, I'm such a huge fan of yours. Oh, thank yeah. you so yeah. much. I can't believe you're like, can carry on with The Daily Show. We love that. Listen, man, somebody got to pay my mortgage. <laughs> he is 11 years old, as you heard him say, journalist Jeremiah Fennell, interviewing Travis Kelsey ahead of the Super Bowl 58. Now, Jeremiah may only be in the fifth grade, but he has already managed to score interviews that all of us are trying to get with some very big <laughs> names. Tracy Morgan, Michael Phelps, Brock Purdy, just to name a few. And we are very lucky to have Jeremiah join us here in the studio. Good morning, Jeremiah. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We've been talking about you all morning, but before we get to what you do, I want people to know a little bit about your background. Because your mom was telling me that you were born uh, with a missing gland in your brain that caused some problems for you. The doctors had told your mother that you would not be able to hear, talk, or walk, and that her going, her having you could possibly end her life too. They, had, they advised her not to have the baby because it was such a, a dire case. I know your mom has shared all this with you, so I'm not, this isn't news to you. When you hear about how you started your life, what do you think about that? Um, honestly, I just feel blessed and thankful and grateful that I'm still here. I'm like a walking blessing and I'm able, that me and my mom are still able to walk earth and both of us are still alive and living well. Yes, you're living very well. And your first language was sign language, right? Yeah. Because they didn't think you'd be able to talk. Yeah, the doctors told my mom that we, I wouldn't be able to hear, so my mom decided um, to start with family to um, teach me sign language. Yes, and even when family members say, no, 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 Lorraine, you should really think about this, your mom persevered and we're so glad she did. <laughs> so let's talk about you because you love sports. When the, Your mom says this happened when you were three. At three, what did you notice about sports that you said, I'd like to do that? I just remember sitting in my bed watching a Raiders game, and I think seeing all the Rowdy fans and seeing the players enjoy the game, I think that made me love it a touch at early age, and I think ever since I just I couldn't stop loving this sport. Because you can't play, you can't play sports yourself, you were told. I played contact sports. Um, well, I didn't play contact you sports. Didn't play I con played sports, mm -hmm. but I couldn't play contact sports. Mm -hmm. So I could play like tennis, but I couldn't play football. Yeah. So I did play flag football, which doesn't count. Uh -huh. I played basketball. <laughs> it doesn't count. <laughs> yes, it, it counts. <laughs> I played basketball like, nah. and I played t-ball. Okay. So I played those. But then after I played those, the doctor said, even though we said he can't play contact sports, he just can't, he just shouldn't play sports. Sports period. at all. So yeah, after that, I decided to go into journalism instead because those are the two things that I was like very interested to. Yeah, look at and you've developed those talents. That's exactly right. Yes. You're so poised and so cool and laid back. Is it overwhelming because of the amount of ten attention that you're getting now? And how do mm -hmm. you prepare for your interviews? Mm. Um, it's not overwhelming because it, I think it's just amazing to see how far I've gone because I started off as a seven-year-old like in my mom's room and we were commentating <laughs> in Raiders games on the NFL YouTube channel mm -hmm. which were copyrighted they were copyrighted videos and now I'm here on CBS mornings and so <laughs> it's it's not overwhelming it's really just beautiful for me that I'm able to be here yes and to prepare for my interviews I honestly just like to research the people that I know I'm about to interview and then come up with some questions that I really want to know yeah, so when you're, you and your mom are watching in the bedroom, you're watching the game, and you're preparing, what do you, and you said you started commentating. What was that like at seven? Do you remember, what, 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 what would you say? I just remember, I don't know, because my mom tells me when I was like two years old, I couldn't talk, but then when I'd watch a football game, I knew every, I knew every word. Wow. So at seven years old, I think I just knew the sport and I was able to commentate it well, and I, I don't really, I don't have any too vivid memories about it, but I do just remember me knowing the sport and me being able to commentate it. Ah. So you've, we showed the number of people that you've interviewed, all big names, big stars. Is there someone that you would like to interview that you have not yet had the opportunity to interview? Oh, definitely. There's a bunch of people, but I think my top three is probably Tom Brady, but okay. I want a two in one because I want to commentate an NFL game with him. Well, we oh. have a surprise for you today. So number one is Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> Jareek. <laughs> he, he also gave you a look like, why are you playing? Yes. Why are you clowning me? He, he didn't even fall he for it. He did not fall for it, Gail. I, I thought it was Patrick Mahomes, sure but you're it's saying it's happen. Tom Brady. Go Tom ahead. Brady, yep. LeBron, and then Steph. It'll happen. And then Steph. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh. Hey, do you have a favorite sport? Because um, you do them well, but you do them it's 50 very well. It's 50-50 with football and basketball, and every once in a while I watch baseball. 
You, what about baseball? Sorry. Every once in a while, I'll watch it, but I'm mostly into football and basketball uh -huh. because, like, those are the two primary sports for me. Something tells me we have not seen the last of you. No. Yeah. Yeah. Get ready to say, but what is your dream job? We all assume that you want to be a sports broadcaster. Yeah, so? I definitely want to keep this this um, career because I very I enjoy it very much, and I think that this could be a long-lasting career. Mm. We're cheering you on, you Jeremiah. Sure you know listen, you'll be listen, sitting. Are. This is the thing, Vlad. He's only going to get better. That's exactly what's so right. amazing exactly. about the you. fact that he says, "Gail, like I research the person I'm going yes. to interview, and then I come up with my questions." Let me tell you, there's some people who are adults who don't do that in this <laughs> yes. business. So, good on you, man. Are you We're are you dating you yet? No. Okay. <laughs> you want to though? No. <laughs> you no, know, I do have a ten year old. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. He's not interested. Not yet. No, you got <laughs> Come back and time. see us in five years, Jeremiah. <laughs> Those no's uh, were very emphatic. They, they were very emphatic. They were uh, like, you people are annoying me. <laughs> Jeremiah, Jeremiah, we are it's cheering. It's the side eye that I love. <laughs> Jeremiah, you're amazing, yeah. brother. Thank you very much for being here. It was our honor to have you here. Our next guest has been called one of the most dynamic performers of her time. We're mm -hmm. talking about award-winning actor Lashana Lynch. Her resume includes, listen to her resume. Movies like Captain Marvel and The Woman King saw them both. She was also the first black female 007, 007 agent in the history of the James Bond franchise, Drop the Microphone, Ms. Lynch. But she says her latest project is her dream role. She plays Bob Marley's wife, Rita, in the highly anticipated new biopic. It's called Bob Marley, One Love. It's made by Paramount Pictures, part of our parent company, Paramount Global. This is a preview for you. He didn't think I had my own opportunities. Huh? I had the solids, I had offers, and I gave them up for the message for us. And they threw it in my face. Uh. Who really know you? Who really care about you, Bob? Chris, the marketing genius, are done signing deals in the dark. Mm. You swim in pollution, you get polluted. We used to talk about this and everything else when you only had one shirt. I give you everything you ask me for. Everything. Mm. God, I love that scene. Such I love this movie. movie. Lashana Lynch, we're very glad wow. to say, joins us now. Good morning to you, Lashana. We're so glad you're here. Yes, we are. Now, I'm fascinated by you in this role because you say you're, we know you're of Jamaican descent and this role was offered to you and you said at first, you weren't sure you wanted to do it. Why? I was surprised by that. I was surprised by it myself, actually. I thought I would jump at it, but I think I had an immediate protection for Mrs. Marley, for her narrative, and just the female narrative in general, mm -hmm. in a movie like this that can get very easily swallowed up by the male, the yes. legend. And I didn't want her to be reduced to the wife, the mother, the woman on the side, the one that just happens to be in the band. I wanted her to really sing. So I had a sit-down conversation with the director before I even got I, the script. I like I had a sit-down wow. conversation. I, I did. I this sat is down. what I'm thinking, Mr. Director. <laughs> Basically. But, but then you Good went you. and met with Rita Marley herself. Yeah. And I'm curious about the conversation you had. What was the story you wanted to tell? Because this woman has been through it about his life. You know, there was many sides to Bob Marley, they say, including, mm. you know, extramarital affairs, his political views, his musical talents. What was the conversation you wanted to have with her? How did you approach that meeting with her? What did you say? Well, I, I had a, about two, three pages of notes in a notebook and came, came in literally like this, like, so I'm gonna come in, I'm not trying to be a journalist and I'm not trying to, you know, like trying to drag information out of you. But um, I found that as soon as I got in, I had to put aside me being an actor and literally think of myself as a vessel for this woman. Mm. I wanted her truth. What did you do with your notes? That you... They stayed in my bag. Oh, they stayed in your <laughs> they bag? They stayed oh. in my bag. I came in, um, I sat down on the floor, literally in front of her, crossed my legs, and I just soaked her in for like four hours uh -huh. and just let her speak. Mm -hmm. Because I realized that the more that she speaks to me is the more that I'll be able to, you know, portray her spirit and her energy on set on days when I may be confused or uh -huh. not knowing if I'm doing a good job, I'll just rely on her aura. You wrote on Instagram, <clears throat> I'm always so charged after a role, but this as an artist, as an emotional being, as a melanated woman, as a Jamaican, to use the word changed would be an understatement. Yeah. How did this role change you? It shifted my perspective of how to handle myself as a woman, as a black woman, and a woman of Jamaican descent. I wanted to, I've, I've always been in like a, a, like a, a journey to 
be more still mm. and more grounded in my core. And I believe I'm of that anyway because I come from great women. Mm. But playing such an amazing human being, I just realised that the kind of grace and poise and elegance that I have in the back somewhere should just always be at the front. Mm. So playing Rita Marley, her strength, her poise and her calm is something that has really sat with me and stayed with me and I think will kind of pull me through a life of choosing really great roles that are going to help me learn and shift in myself. Mm. We have to say something about Kingsley, your performance with Kingsley, Please. because I, I, I was sort of embarrassed. You know, I knew Bob Marley, who he was. I know a little bit about his family, but I didn't really know him and his background. And I think mm. what you all have done is bringing him to a whole new audience. Tell us about working with him, what you two wanted to say what you two wanted to do, because you said sometimes we had to fight for some of our scenes. Yeah, I think it's always a, a challenge and a fight when you're a black artist on set, especially when there's two of you, um, knowing that you're fighting for someone who made such change and such shifts, radical shifts in the world. You want to make sure that you as an artist are approaching this in a way that is protective of them, but also protective of yourself. So there were days, I mean, we met up really early on before I had an audition and I just said, what's your plans, what do you want? What do you need and what do you need from me mm. for me to service you as an artist on set? That man is one of the most hardest working men I've ever worked with in my entire career. Oh. Um, and there were days when I literally felt like Rita Marley for him. Uh -huh. How are you? Did you sleep? Have you had water? Hmm. Relax. Yeah. Again, mm. relax. Again, relax. Mm. Yeah. Because he's given so much of his spirit to this man and I could see that he needed to be serviced in a way that he probably hasn't as an artist Amazing. before. Um, so we had an understanding from the beginning. The songs are really a co-star here as well. I mean, as they should be. Yes. Uh, and you get to see the creative process. It's part of the drama, yeah. which I love. It's a great part of the movie. Do you have yeah. a favorite song, a favorite Bob Marley song, or something that helped you in the role? Um, uh, it changes every day. Right now I'm at Natural Mystic <laughs> because it just makes me feel, I don't know, empowered. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, it was Steer It Up. That helped me do my chores every day. Um, as a child. Yeah. Um, going back to being typical, No Woman, No Cry. Yes, There's yes. a moment in the film where you really feel what that song means for her. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I'm just glad that we got to keep that moment in the movie. Yeah. Um, really special. There's, but I mean, the whole Exodus album as well, yes. which we get yeah. to yeah. fully Speaking celebrate. Speaking of really special. Can't so wait for you. people to see it, LaShawn. Thank you so much for joining us. Our next guest, he's played everybody from Barack Obama to Malcolm X to one of the Kins in that Barbie movie. And guess what? Now he's bringing Bob Marley to the big screen. His name is Kingsley Benadir. He stars as the iconic musician in the new biopic, Bob Marley, One Love. You just heard the song. The movie is set back in the 1970s after a failed attempt to murder Marley. The experience puts him on a path to try and unify Jamaica through his revolutionary music. Here's a preview of Benadir in action jamming. With jamming, the thing that jamming was a thing of the past. With jamming, and I hope this jam is gonna last. No bullet can stop us now, we need to beg, no we won't bow. Neither can be bought nor sold. We all defend the right, that the children must unite. Who oh, life is worth much more than gold. We are so happy to say that Kingsley Benadir joins us. As you see in the studio, good morning to you. Good morning. I love the movie. I love the movie, and I have to I say, do too. And we'll get back into Bob Marley's life in just a second because I was embarrassed by what I didn't know. But I want to talk about you playing this role because initially you had some hesitation because you don't sing, you say, and you don't play the guitar. Nope. I don't sing. Good morning, by the way. Yeah, good and morning. Nice, nice good, to good, be here. Great good, to have you. Yeah, and you're not uh, Jamaican. Not and you're not, yeah, there's that too, yeah. It was, it, I never had any, the, my, my reservations were only when the audition, when I heard of the audition, I really didn't know anything about the film. Uh -huh. I didn't know the family were involved. I didn't really know what the, the I didn't know what the vibe was around it. So, I, and, I, and I was like, I'm not, I don't feel like this is right. There must be some sort of mistake here. The only thing Bob and I really have in common is that, you know, he has a white parent and a black parent and he's uh -huh. mixed. And, and so I just felt like, yeah, I don't sing, I don't dance, I don't speak Jamaican patois, I, 
you know, as long as I just want to, I just want to make sure everyone knows. Yeah, yeah, that, that everybody's on board with that. Yeah, because your Jamaican accent too, Kingsley. Let's talk about that. It's not a matter for you of just listening to a bunch of tapes. That's not what you did here, because you seem to have captured the accent really well. Uh, for me, you know, spending you know a year or two listening to Bob, it's for me the Jamaican patois was more like a language. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't a dialect. Normally, you have one dialect coach mm -hmm. on set. Uh. We we ended up with a language team. Mm. It was like seven or eight people on set at the same time. You know, there was a real the commitment to the authenticity of how Bob spoke, not just the Jamaican patois. And uniquely to Bob, how Bob spoke Jamaican patois, because Bob traveled and he he picked up words from Europe and mm. America. He was born up in the country, but he grew up in Trenchtown. So there was learning the language, but then there was also kind of understanding how Bob spoke. And everyone who knows Bob remembered, you know, Bob talked the way Bob talked. Yeah. And, like, no one talked like Bob. Yeah. Bob talked in his own way. So there was a lot of that. What, what I did, what I could control was how much I listened to him. And Sadella sent me, really early on, Sadella, Bob's daughter, sent me a, a, a file, really. And I opened it, and there was hours and hours and hours of Bob Mm. talking in interviews that kind of haven't been released or wow. aren't available wow. on YouTube that only the family have. So I didn't even know that was going to be my process, but I just, I was scrolling just going, right, well, I better, I better get listening, mm. you know? And then I was listening, and I had to have an honest conversation with myself and say, like, I'm understanding about 70% of what he's saying. Wow. Wow. So then I started calling all my Jamaican friends and people who I've grown up with to come around and help me translate, yeah. and we would, like, transcribe and all. So we ended up, well, I ended up transcribing all of those interviews that Sadella sent me, and then we broke it down into Frederick Cassidy's language, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, Frederick Cassidy's Jamaican linguist who Incredible. created the Jamaican Patois Dictionary. Yeah. And so, you know, it just went on like that. So think about then what you did to prepare for this role, right? You're learning a language and a dialect, yeah. right? And being able to deliver it. And then there's the music part of it. Yeah. And then there's and, the body language. Yes. But as, an, act, the body as an actor, I go, ooh, that's exciting. I want to do it. <laughs> I just don't want to mess it up. Yeah. You know? And I just want to make sure the family know that I'm I'm really starting from scratch. And I need a lot of help. I had so many coaches on this job. And know? Kingsley, they still wanted you, despite yeah. knowing that you didn't have this, as they still wanted you. I'm a good talker. So yeah, I'm, but I'm good, <laughs> when I met Ziggy, I talked to him. You say as an actor, that's exciting. But as a person, um, that could seem like a daunting task. You know, we, we talked to Lashana uh, Lynch. We had her on the show yesterday. yesterday yeah. And she talked about how she was checking on you on the set mm -hmm. because you were so deep into the character. What is it like diving in wholeheartedly, giving everything you got to Bob, and then having to pull yourself out of that? Was that difficult? It was a real, when I look back, it was a joy, you know? Like, it, I wasn't sleeping much, for sure. And I think Lashana's probably... Lashana was probably picking up on just my health, you know, generally, and, and like... But there, there, I just felt there was so much work to do, and Bob was in such a specific headspace in this time. Mm. He was working, you know, and, and he wasn't sleeping. He, he was locked He in. was up at five every day, writing songs, they were running, they were in the studio till three, so I guess I kind of was just doing my own version of that, like trying to get into his spirit in some way. Mm. I don't know, but Lashana really, she, she just... She looked out for me. She looked out for everyone. She was the light of the set, you know, yeah. when the show. Kind of like was... Rita did Bob. You, you, yeah. could, you could feel that light. And what's your headspace like, Kingsley? Because you're working on the Barbie movie at the same time, and you're working on the Bob Marley movie. Mm. What's your headspace? Because as we know, they're two very different movies. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I signed up to Barbie before I got the offer for Bob, uh -huh. and I was like, I'm going to be on this set for three and a half months, and I really need to start learning the guitar. Like, I, I didn't want to yeah. waste any time. So I was just finding gaps and moments to start, you know, Play. listening to Bob and learning the patois and playing mm. the guitar. So as soon as Greta called cut, I would just kind of run Go behind off. the Mojo Dojo Casa and, <laughs> and, and do some patois. Bob's dreadlocks, iconic. They're real, it's a wig, what's the story? That was a, a, a team, like a, a specialist team who, who built the hair over many, many months. And mm. um, yeah, they did an incredible job. Wow. In wow. the last line of the movie, could you say it about it, what his life meant? In, in, in Bob's voice? Not in Bob's voice. I, I mean, I, his accent, yeah. Not, <laughs> yeah, his accent. I, I, won't, I won't be doing any Jamaican patois <laughs> this morning or, or ever again. It was, I, 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 there's, there's a respect that I have for the language where outside of set, when, when yeah. I wasn't being, oh, when I wasn't it. surrounded by Jamaicans you. who yeah. were able to direct and help, of I just course. wanted to keep it sacred, you know? Yeah. Um, 
Right. And the language was the one thing that the studio and the family convinced me at the beginning was going to be the most yeah. important. Well, Kingsley, Congrats. Benadir, thank you so much.